Good evening to all. Today is May 23rd, 2022. Thank you uh, to those of us joining, jo those of you joining us in person in Conjois Auditorium, and, as well as those online for the Burlington City Council meeting. The time is 6:20. We're a little bit behind. Um, we're going to begin our agenda this evening with a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, Councillor Barlow, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I move to amend, adopt the agenda as follows. Add to the consent agenda item 6.38, communication from Chris Flynn regarding redistricting with, a, with the action to waive the reading, accept the communication, and place it on file. Note revised version of agenda item 7.03, resolution, enforcement of bed and breakfast permit requirements and suspension of new bed and breakfast permits. Uh, Councillor Shannon and Bergman, per Councillor Shannon and Bergman. Thank, thank you, Councillor Barlow. There's a motion to adopt with amendments our agenda uh, by Councillor Barlow. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Bergman. Is there any di discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Oppo aye. Opposed, please say no. Uh, we have an agenda. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a work session regarding Memorial Auditorium. Uh, um, there's been a request that before we go to the work session, um, just because there is someone who is here to speak specifically to Memorial Auditorium, that they be given um, time as opposed to during public forum. So, um, Jim, James Lockridge, if you would like to come forward and speak now, um, and if we can try to keep those comments to two minutes, that would be great. Thanks so much and welcome. Jim, I'm not sure that you have the computer, the, um, excuse me, I don't know that you have that on. Do you have the button? It should be green. Thank you. No worries. Go ahead, start again, please. You were elected to office to seek and embrace the tasks that improve our city and steward the legacies that previous generations trusted you with. And I want to make a statement that challenges you as a city council to see Memorial Auditorium as a canvas for the expression of our values. We care about each other and being a community. Community happens when we gather in a common space. We care about recovering from the pandemic crisis Reopening our civic hall would be a statement of resiliency. We honor our veterans. Memorial Auditorium is a literal landmark that makes those who served in uniform recognizable to every single visitor to Main Street. We are an equitable, inclusive society. Restoring the city's performing arts stages ensures we all have a platform for expression. We want our youth to grow into engaged citizens. 242 Maine was where a sense of belonging was imparted. We trust the voice of our residents and invest in transparent public processes to learn most completely and responsibly what the right path forward is when the city makes big decisions. In 2018, the people of Burlington said they wanted Memorial Auditorium restored and returned to use. You each do your own thinking, so the best I can ask, the best I can do is ask if you share these values, please recognize that Memorial Auditorium should be returned to having the uses that thousands of Burlington residents said they wanted when the Center for Research and Public Policy surveyed more than 2,100 of them or 2,300 signed the Save242Main.com petition. I offer these comments with faith in the values-based leadership you'll show as our civic leaders. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, the work session regarding a Memorial Auditorium, uh, it's going to be led by Samantha Dunn and uh, Brian Pine of CEDO. And my understanding is that you'll be giving us a brief presentation and then there'll be time for questions and answers and maybe a little bit of work by us counselors to help you um, help sort of refine the direction that we're gonna be going in. So if you'd like to join us, please.
Thank you. Should we just start right in here? Sure. Right. Sure. So the, uh, the record, I'm Brian Pine, CEDO Director, and? Samantha Dunn, Assistant Director for Community Works. We're lucky that Samantha joined us last fall, and the title Community Works doesn't always necessarily um, translate for a lot of folks, but Samantha's job is, broadly speaking, responsibility for public-private projects that involve uh, city assets, city real estate, um, sort of the development side of, of CEDO's role and brings a, um, a background in both architecture, affordable housing development, finance, and uh, all of the essential things that we need. So we're, we're really glad to have Samantha with us and um, uh, as part of this project, uh, I think we're in, we're in good hands with her work. Um, I think I would just add to the comments that Jim Lockridge made earlier that Memorial holds, if you've lived in this community for any real amount of time, Memorial holds some special place in all of our hearts. I know that um, I, in uh, the mid 80s, then Mayor Sanders had created this thing called the Youth Employment Program and out of another department or off initiative that he created, they had this idea that there would be a daycare for city workers to be able to afford childcare. And so he hired, he said to the youth office, go find someone to renovate the basement of Memorial Auditorium. And I, I brought a, a group of young people into Memorial and a month later we had created a space for a childcare center um, to operate out of Memorial. And fast forward about 10 years later, our first kid was born and I um, was lucky enough to be working for CEDO and so we had access to childcare and Memorial and our first son went to childcare there until it moved to the Burlington Children's Space with the Multi-Gen Center. Um, the place holds a lot of memories. Um, I coached both Parks and Rec basketball and Center City baseball and we actually would do our spring training in Memorial. Um, both our kids played music there through rock camp and what was called trad camp which is where they try and play traditional music. So the reason why I share this is just because I think if we ask anyone who's lived in Burlington for a period of time, you'll find there's a personal story and a connection to Memorial. It means a great deal, I think, to our collective uh, identity as a community. It's, it's about to be celebrating 100 years from when it was created. And um, I think we as, as the city, um, our responsibility is to steward city assets and city resources as responsibly as we possibly can. And honestly, it's kind of, I would say, a, a something that I share some level of um, um, embarrassment, honestly, that, we've, we've, that this public asset has deteriorated to the point where it is now, which Samantha will explain some of the serious conditions that we're facing. Um, but I think um, finding a path forward in the past has, has eluded us uh, because of the, both the complexity of the of the project and assembling a partner and assembling the financing, but also to ensure that there's a sustainable operations plan going forward um, is, a, is a real challenge. And so I think hopefully from our work session tonight, we will be able to um, establish next steps for bringing this project um, you know, to, to a point where we have the ability to make some key decisions and, and it's really the council's um, we're taking direction from the council as far as what those decisions, uh, where we will end up, but we wanted to at least provide information to you now about the conditions of the, of the building, um, some of the key decision points that need to be made um, over the coming weeks and months, and um, lay out for the council some of that information. I think I'm going to run upstairs and shut that shade, though, because it's making it kind of hard to see this. So... I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the microphone over. I think you can get in, Daryl, up there. Yeah, I think, I think you can get in. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Samantha, who will carry us, take us through um, an update on a, a number of factors regarding Memorial, the conditions, and the options, uh, and the dif and the decisions that you all will be making, um, but also getting your direct feedback about direction and guidance that you want to share with us because it's we're gonna take your lead here. Thanks, Brian, and uh, it's nice to see everyone. My first uh, city council since uh, joining the city in uh, the uh, end of October, just last year. Um, I would say maybe six weeks after I started, I got an email saying, um, so this uh, Memorial Auditorium is, this is a challenge.
challenge that the city has, and it's, it's going to be on your <laughs> plate. And um, I kind of set a, a timeline to be able to come to City Council uh, in May to, with uh, the information that we, uh, I think we need to start making some decisions for moving forward. So that, that feels like success for sure. Um, I think, as Brian alluded to, most people know the building was built about 100 years ago um, with a large uh, public assembly auditorium. Um, it's very valuable as a, a Chittenden County Vermonter. I grew up visiting Memorial Auditorium. My, you know, stories from my parents who went to college and uh, visited, as, you know, very close to, to our hearts in a lot of ways. Um, and I think as Brian also alluded to, it's been uh, almost three decades that the city has really struggled with being able to maintain uh, this historic building. Um, and the building was closed in 2016, so we're now in year seven of the building being closed um, due to public safety. Um, and, and in those three decades, there was uh, a number of studies have been done to understand what's happening um, in the building and sort of what it would take to get it stabilized. There was a, the, the first, uh, a bond vote that failed in 1994 that was gonna take on that first um, addressing deterioration, um, some more studies, and then um, there was about $10 million in the 2021 bond uh, that failed that was gonna do some uh, substantial rehab to the building. Um, Jim mentioned the amazing uh, 2018 redevelopment effort. It's, uh, I wasn't a part of that effort, but I know um, it was run really successfully by CETO with a lot of partners to get input um, and come up with a plan. And for people who want to see more about that or dig into like the survey responses, that's all on um, CETO's website, which is linked here, but easy to find if you just search Memorial Auditorium. Um, and that really that effort um, kind of did the, you know, provided four options for next steps. One was to mothball the building, uh, just keep it as it is, keep it closed. Um, the next one was for basic renovations, and that's really, um, I think, what that $10 million in the 2021 bond was directed towards. I, it no longer would have been enough money, but to, um, to be able to reopen, address code issues and structural safety issues and be able to reopen the building kind of as is without updating it. Um, the third is the community hub option, which was a fully uh, re-envisioned um, you know, community hub where there was performance and youth space and all these things um, that the community uh, was asking for in that building. And, and there's a design, uh, you know, a schematic design and pricing that went along with that. Um, and then uh, the fourth one was that same hub, but um, uh, sort of developing it along with the rest of the gateway block um, and to bring in private partners to the project. Um, so, the um, costs for those same four options are here. Operating costs, I think, um, as Brian mentioned, you know, coming up with a plan has to do not just with raising the capital, but being able to continue to uh, maintain and, and operate the building. Um, background information. So what happened, um, really, I think what happened was COVID. Um, but the, the default was this, was the mothball approach where uh, nothing, no um, decisions or investment were uh, con continued to be made. Um, so the building has continued to deteriorate. Um, I, Catherine was just reminding me that we have to uh, ask her permission anytime someone is gonna enter the building for liability purposes, they have to sign a waiver. Um, it's, you know, the structure is continuing to deteriorate. There's continued to be water infiltration. Um, uh, people have uh, caused a fair amount of damage inside the building that have broken in. Um, and we have an amazing um, set of uh, Parks Department staff that are maintaining these uh, original boilers to make sure the heat stays on, uh, to make sure that uh, the fire um, suppression system will work. So during the heating system, there's a staff member that visits that building every day to sort of talk to the boilers. Um, Samantha, just want, I do just want to expand on the point Samantha hit on, but briefly, she wasn't here at the time, but very much following the 2018 process, the plan was to move forward uh, and attempt to bring forward a community hub type option. Um, but the, and we took, we had a, several processes that were completed on the road towards that. We had uh, 
um, a RFP process for an operator that did somewhat succeed in identifying a potential operator that would work up with us uh, in a community hub basis, which gave us enough confidence that we were starting the process to move forward with a uh, RFP for a development um, partner. And um, as we were preparing the documents for that RFP, uh, <clears throat> March 2020 arrived and all, all of those efforts basically stopped until um, uh, we've been emerging from the pandemic and Samantha was able to start this work again last fall and and we find ourselves in very different circumstances than uh, than leading into the pandemic so I just want to make sure that was clear Great. thanks Bill. Um, and, and so I think following that given sort of what was happening um, with the mothball and um, following the failure of the bond vote in November of last year um, we decided to move forward with a different kind of assessment and one that was uh, really based on just immediate stabilization. Um, what do we need to do today to make sure um, the building doesn't uh, continue to severely deteriorate or injure someone? At the same time, um, we did some hazardous materials testing um, to better understand, I think, thinking about what's going on with the high school and just to better understand that, that part of the building as we knew uh, it's information we need to have to move forward. Um, and then getting a cost estimate for demolition just to be, make sure that we had all of the options on the table. Um, and that report is also available on the CETA website. Um, the recommendations that came out of that, that uh, report was done by Engineering Ventures who had done several uh, previous assessments on the building, we're very familiar with the building, um, said that these are sort of the immediate things that need to happen. Um, there's uh, damaged and uh, undersized structure uh, in the roof that needs to be sistered uh, that could really fail at any time with a snow load. Um, this would uh, put together a proposal to uh, repair and kind of seal the parapet where we think most of the water is coming into the building. There is a new roof on the building, so there's no longer water coming through the roof, but it's still coming through that parapet. And then adding um, containment netting because of sort of the way the building is failing and moving, there's a lot of risk for bricks to be falling off the building and you know could really uh, hurt somebody if they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, at the same time, um, parks um, facilities folks have come up with a plan for continuing to provide adequate heating over the next three years, which is really required, again, to keep the sprinkler system operating, but and really just to keep um, the building. When most of us know in Vermont, if a building goes through a freeze thaw, uh, that it's, very, it's pretty hard to recover from in a building of this age. Um, so those were the main um, recommendations that came out of that report. Um, so I think one direction, I think we know where we're going, but wanted to make sure to hear from city council, like at this time, sort of moving forward, is there, you know, should we move forward with stabilizing the building under those recommendations? There was a million dollars uh, for this stabilization in the bond that passed in March. So the funding is available to do this stabilization. Um, and I think it's important step for the city to take um, to, protect the building and uh, protect people in and around the building. Um, it is a capital investment with uh, no active benefit. It doesn't mean we're gonna make that investment and you're still not gonna be able to occupy that building. Um, or the alternative option right now, sort of like in making a decision now is to demolish the building. Um, the price for that came in at about 3.35 million. I don't think anyone's recommending that, but just information uh, to have so that people feel like they can make an informed decision. Um, demolishing the building, of course, we would lose that historic fabric, um, but it would eliminate the um, liability associated with the building and ongoing um, operations costs. We spend between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year uh, keeping that building mothballed. Do people, anyone have questions about these two options? Um, and I think this is kind of why we're here um, tonight is to talk through, like, as, as uh, the mayor was saying, we had a path that we were moving on, like, why aren't we just jumping right back on that path? Um, I think there are a couple of, of obvious re or clear reasons. Uh, one of them is the 
escalating construction costs. So um, if you look at the bottom row here, you can see that that $33 million uh, project is um, now at about $45 million. And honestly, just given the way that costs have continued to escalate, this was an escalator I ran in December. Um, so it could be $52 million. You know, with construction costs right now, it's, um, it's, it's a much higher capital number. And then, of course, with um, the need for the city to bond for the new high school, uh, that's going to take up a significant amount of the city's bonding capacity. So I think um, once we've made this decision, yes, we're going to stabilize or, or demo. Um, the next thing is, okay, once the building is stabilized, how are we going to move forward to um, make sure this uh, building continue to be an asset? So I just, <clears throat> just want to make sure the point is clear, too. The increased cost is part of the problem, but the maybe even larger issue is um, even the uh, 20, um, even the $30 million plan was going to require $15 million um, of general obligation uh, bonding in, in that vision. And um, now we're looking at even higher total and our general obligation capa bonding capacity uh, is essentially zero right now beyond the, the 24 million that we was approved by the voters last year um, uh, given the expectations that essentially all of our bonding capacity for general obligation bonding capacity for some years to come um, is going to be uh, likely committed to the um, uh, new high school. Uh, I just don't see a path where we can make even the uh, $15 million kind of commitment that was assumed several years ago, much less uh, the larger total that would necessary, be necessary now for that uh, prior, prior plan. And um, uh, that could change. Perhaps, you know, eventually we will have new bonding capacity. Perhaps something about the high school needs are going to change. But um, it, uh, it, it seems unlikely, uh, quite unlikely, that we have um, any excess capacity uh, that we can put into Memorial at this point. I think the voters kind of told us that with uh, the vote last fall as well. So I, I, I think that's a critical uh, point to understand about why um, we're in a really different place now than we thought we were in the, the fall of 2019, early 2020, as we were moving towards a bond vote and uh, some kind of uh, development RFP. So in order to uh, move forward, I think that, you know, the city will uh, want to figure out how to enter into some kind of uh, public-private partnership, and there's, those can take a lot of different forms, and so I'm just going to talk about a couple tonight, and one of them um, uh, Jim Lockridge was speaking to, and I think that, um, so this concept is uh, entering into some kind of public-private partnership where the community hub is still the you know, we're working towards generating that uh, community hub vision in Memorial Auditorium, um, but instead of the city bonding uh, for that money with, without the capacity, there's a group of private citizens who are working together to identify the, the majority of the capital resources necessary um, to do that. And I promised um, this group, uh, and I, I don't know exactly, and, if you want to speak to this, when this form, I have a feeling it's that there was like someone heard the word demo, like because I was getting a demo number and people started to pay attention, which is great if that's what it takes. Um, tomorrow I'll try, but I promise that I, um, the this group, because they couldn't all be here tonight, I would read this about um, what they're thinking. So it says, counselors, this information is offered by Melinda Moulton and James Lockridge in support of a public forward option for the future of Memorial Auditorium. In 2018, a public process that included responses from more than 2,100 Burlington residents led to the approval of a plan to return Memorial Auditorium to, a to use as a multifunction public commons. Programming priorities specified by more than 50% of surveyed residents include shows, community meetings, farmers markets, and youth music space. That public process and outcome was catalyzed when every NPA in the city organized an event in support of Memorial Auditorium at Contois Auditorium. A new community group, Get It Done Memorial Auditorium, has formed to aid the city in pursuing this plan. 
recognizing that throughout the recent mayoral terms, the administration hasn't had the capacity to resolutely accomplish the public vision for Memorial Auditorium, which included funding goals for phased improvements to the building. This group, along with city, state, and federal support, proposes to develop and steer new financial resources into this goal, harnessing the experience, relations, and political wisdom of Burlington residents and regional institutions who are committed to restoring the building and accomplishing this authentic public plan. Get it done. And the City of Burlington administration and departments would demonstrate the confidence, values, and efficacy of a public-private alliance with the people of Burlington and responsibly steward a historic and meaningful landmark into a productive, self-reliant future of service to the city. The Get It Done group has been coordinating with groups like the Preservation Trust of Vermont and Vermont's congressional delegates while growing their list of supporters. So that's Get It Done Vermont, that uh, Get It Done Memorial, that's uh, one uh, kind of option for moving forward with a public-private partnership. Um, there are, obviously, if that were successful, a lot of pros to that. It's a vision uh, that has been supported uh, by the community. Um, I think there's a question of the feasibility of raising the funds required that would need to be considered um, and just, you know, looked, you know, explored further. Um, another option, I think, is a different a kind of public-private partnership where it would uh, likely be with uh, a non-citizen group where we would continue to uh, retain the historic fabric of Memorial Auditorium, um, but without all of the uses that are there. So this would be an adaptive reuse of the building um, where we would work together to identify what are some of the public uses that, that we could uh, continue to provide while there are other uses uh, that a private developer uh, would put into the building. Um, and I think the, the main um, downside of this, of course, is the loss of the public assembly space that, that's so meaningful to all of us. I think very hard to imagine adaptive reuse of that building that includes a large uh, public assembly space um, with other uh, non-public uses. Um, and I think another thing I want to make sure we're thinking about tonight um, together is thinking about, are we, do we want to think just about Memorial Auditorium or are we ready to um, think about that whole block when thinking about a public-private partnership um, to, to be having, developing a vision and a process for, for redevelopment of that whole block, um, I think especially with the Great Streets Main Street work uh, starting to get underway, there's a real opportunity to um, have not just a revitalized building, but a, but a block there. So I think this was just sort of an um, overview of what we're hoping to hear from the City Council tonight. Should we stay, move forward with stabilizing the building? Are people interested in exploring more demolition? Um, talk about what the uh, goals and priorities of a public-private partnership would be, and then look just a little bit at next steps. And I know, Karen, this was a slide you thought maybe we had forgotten to fill out, <laughs> but um, my hope is to, is to get input from, from this group on um, if we're thinking about that partnership, you know, what are the must-haves and, and what would be nice. This is an opportunity, it's a work session, this is an opportunity for counselors to give feedback as to, uh, you know, what are the items that we feel are must-haves within the building and those that we feel would be nice. And yes, I did when I was reading this. I said, hmm, I think they left, they left this incomplete. Well, now we know why. Um, we're hoping, you're hoping that we will fill in those blanks for, and at least help guide this um, conversation. So if there are counselors who have opinions or uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul, and thank you for the presentation. Um, the, a lot of work was done in the surveying process to flush out the community must-haves, would-be nice priorities. And as we had discussed in the in PAC, mm -hmm. I really think that going back to that and looking at what the community has asked for here is what's important, not so much what 12 people around this table um, are thinking. The, the real must have that this group must grapple with is money um, to do anything. Mm -hmm. And um, I very much appreciate the private effort 
to raise that money. Um, and I think to do that, the funders will also have their must-haves, I imagine. So that's, that's pretty much my concern, is uh, reaching a match between the community priorities and the funder priorities. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor Shannon. Councilor Barlow, and before, um, before you speak, Councilor Barlow, just wanted to note that um, Councilors Hansen and House are on, although we can't see them right now, um, they are online. If either of you wish to speak, um, I'm looking at the raise hand function if you wish to speak and be recognized. Um, Councilor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I had a, just a clarifying question around um, the statement on, I think, the last slide where you, um, it indicated that a public-private partnership, one of the cons would mean the loss of public assembly sp space. Why would that have to be? It seemed like there's a number of arrangements that could be made in any public-private partnership and we could incentivize a private developer or even, you know, pay a lease fee to have space as a city that wouldn't require capital expense on the part of the city but would still um, ensure that we had that space available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's, I think um, the, there could certainly be public meeting space. When I say public assembly, assembly space, I'm saying sort of that, the, the main auditorium. What, if you uh, keep the main auditorium, there's not a lot of redevelopment to happen for, a, you know, for a private investor. Um, in that building, I think it's possible, and I think that's a little bit of what I'm wanting to hear tonight. Of, is like, is maintaining that public assembly space, that auditorium, the most important thing? And in, in that, you know, and then we're looking at, do we could we work with a private investor that does the whole block and the keeps the public assembly space, or do we give time to work with get it done memorial and focus on on that and not working with private investor? Um, so I think that's still some of the input. I think we could definitely, um, as Councilor Shannon uh, was speaking to, there are a number of other uses, like pu just public meeting space that could be incorporated without keeping the auditorium. Uh, could we include a youth space without keeping the auditorium? I think those are all things that we can keep on the table, that, that set of priorities that the community identified. But if we keep the auditorium, uh, there's not really a private um, development that would also be able to work with and, and I guess the other sort of must-have for me is I'd like to understand the relationship of Memorial Auditorium within the context of development of the greater block. Um, and it's, it's hard to just take it as by, its, by itself and on its own. I know that there are other public infrastructure pieces that have to happen, like the sewer piece under the parking lot and, and some of the stabilization that has to go on there. But I would like to understand more about what the opportunities are for the whole block. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Uh, did you want to, was there any comment that you could offer in that regard as far as what, with the suit, with respect to the super block, if that, if that thought has been, thought has been given to that? Yeah, and I don't know, I think, you know, um, Mayor, if you want to speak to that. Sure. I, the, um, there's not a simple answer to that and that there's definitely some uncertainty and a little bit of um, complexity uh, to, uh, uh, to that in a number of ways, maybe most significantly that the city does not own all of the property currently on the block. There are a couple of in-holding properties. Um, uh, that said, I do think um, if it was if we came to a decision that our, our goal was to pursue um, a, a full redevelopment of the block with both the memorial parcel and the gate, gateway of the parking lot parcel and the in, properties in between being developed at the same time, I, I, you know, I think there would be some clarity in that and we likely would be able to find some route forward where uh, the full, at least half block, the southern half of the block could be um, pursued together. I think that, you know, We'd have some uncertainty exactly how we execute that, but if that was the way we wanted to go, which hadn't ha was not the decision back in 2018, there uh, there was going to be a focus on Memorial Auditorium uh, on its own first. Um, if we want to change that because of the changed circumstances and look for a full redevelopment of the southern half of the block, I think that's that's something we likely would be able to pursue. Thank you. Uh, 
Councillor Bergman. Well, um, the first thing that I have to have is a no additional uh, holes in the ground in downtown Burlington. So demolition seems to me to uh, not be a uh, something I want. Um, and uh, I'm intrigued with the, um, the get it done approach, and I happen to agree with Councillor Shannon um, that uh, we should be looking at the uses that the public said they wanted. I was one of the participants of that uh, survey. It was comprehensive, it was not easy. Um, and I guess I need to have a refresher on what those were and what they could mean and sort of the options within that. Um, I have fond memories of uh, shows at uh, Memorial Auditorium. I have fond recollections of the news reports of the, uh, the chaos under the Paquette administration at the, uh, uh, at the auditorium um, that I did not participate in. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, the idea of a big um, public assembly place is sort of interesting. On the other hand, do we have enough uh, capacity in the local area for venues that are larger than the Flynn, but not as big as the fairground? I sure would have liked to have seen Marley one more time before he died, uh, which I had tickets for, but uh, uh, such is life. Um, so I'd really like to, to get some advanced, uh, an advancement of those, so to speak, a real better understanding of what that would mean. And then um, the same thing is true in terms of getting clarity about the funding. Uh, and the way I look at it is non-tax uh, revenues. Uh, I am not a personal fan of the selling of naming rights so that all of the iconic stadiums and arenas are for you know sale to the private sector. On the other hand, I understand why people do that. So um, trying to understand much more deeply what those sources were. Uh, I sat on the other side of this table when we uh, went ahead and bought the waterfront. That was not easy, we didn't have the money. You look at it now. Right, I'm really proud. One, in terms of public policy, uh, a great feather in my cap. So uh, there are monies that we don't know that are out there, uh, but this is a huge. This is much bigger than that. So I totally appreciate what the mayor is saying in terms of the uh, the reach and to make a decision. And I do think we have time if we take it, it's our friend if we use it, and it's our enemy if we don't, um, to really understand what it would take to raise whatever that was, 15 million, 16 million, probably by the time you get done, million. 25, 30 million dollars, uh, add another five, right, to that, because life seems to be like that. So uh, where that money could come from and the sources potentials, uh, I, I, I really like to see that before I start to really understand, but to just circle back and conclude, I don't want to substitute at this point in time my opinions for what the people said, and I would like us to, to really sort of, in a way, double down on what they said and see how we can make that happen. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Bergman. Councillor Chang to be followed by Councillor Hightower. Thank you, President. Thank you for being here, Mr. Pine. And, and this is just maybe the second time hearing about this, and we heard extensive presentation at the PAC meeting, and thank you for coming here again. Um, from my perspective, even though what the community talked about in 2018 will need to be revisited again. We have to start over. We have to go back to the drawing board because the priority is then and the priority is now for the people have substantially changed. With the pandemic, reappraisal, the high school, so on and so forth. The community itself changed. New people here, 
many people le left. So I think it would be very important to go back to the drawing board. Um, I think also it would be amazing. I completely agree with the mayor. But at the same time, the bounding capacity, even if we have it, because Burlington have High School has not used what they want, even if that capacity, we need to think about again these taxpayers to not use the capacity that's left for memorial. I think it would be, again, very important. People have spoken so many times, maybe we have to listen here. They turned down tax increases, they turned down um, bounds that we definitely need, so I think it's important for us to listen. And listening sometimes is to reassess our priorities. I think selling memorial should not be um, should be an option. It should definitely be an option. And people with capital can come develop it, and the community, the city, everyone can use it. I think we should not erase that option. Another element about the community and public-private partnership. I think it would be important also to not only look at it from those that approach the city. Let's expand our horizon with hotels that are in this community. And the Flint Theater, maybe all of them bring them together. What are options in partnership with the city, the hotels, the Flint Theater, to build something meaningful as an option? Another option also, I think we mentioned it at the PAC, regional option of partnership. Winooski, South Burlington, all the surrounding communities what is available for a public assembly space that we can all utilize and, and make a dream come true for every single one of us. Um, yeah, so far that, and thank you for being here again. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Uh, Councillor Hightower. Um, I agree with pieces of what everybody else has said, so I think demolition is not the right way to go um, right now, so I would definitely move to, would love to see the authorization for the stabilization. Um, I think beyond that, I do think we need to figure out the school question first and what that's gonna mean, but I think to truly be a public-private partnership where we have <laughs> enough stake to be able to negotiate on what we want, I think we are gonna have to put up some money, and so looking at what options those are um, once we figure out the school component um, so that we're bringing part of the, and also I think the voters might be more willing to do something if we're like, we're gonna have a $45 million facility that the city is gonna pay X amount for. Um, so I definitely agree with a lot of what's been said and think we should pursue some kind of option, but I think we should definitely be ready to put taxpayer money into this as well in order to keep it a truly public resource. Thank you, uh, Councillor McGee. Thank you, and thank you, Director Pine and Samantha, for the presentation. Um, I just want to add my voice to um, the option to stabilize the building. Uh, I think anything that we can do to ensure that we're able to maintain this vital community space, uh, we should be doing. <clears throat> I think it's an essential, a very versatile uh, gathering space that has not just hosted shows or uh, sporting events, but uh, also the indoor farmers market and so many other uh, uh, essential sort of gatherings that, that we've really missed. Uh, and I think, you know, really emphasizing the youth space that we lost when uh, 242 Main was closed. So I think um, anything that we can do to ensure that if, if the building can't be uh, saved and um, uh, returned to, to that use that we are finding spaces in the city that, that meet those needs, um, I think. Uh, it needs to be part of this process as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, don't see any others. I don't know. Oh, oh Councillor Travers. 
Uh, thank you, President Paul. Uh, I don't have much to add beyond my colleagues here. I will add my voice to uh, those against demolition. I'm mindful of the fact that we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of Memorial Auditorium, and I think it'd be, uh, it, it, would, it would sort of add to the embarrassment for our community if, if, uh, if A, it was uh, unopened um, still by then, uh, let alone demolished. Um, the one piece that I, I would like to add um, that, that I haven't heard here and, and uh, did not see much in the presentation is it's not lost on me that this is uh, called Memorial Auditorium for a reason, which is that it is a war memorial uh, to Burlingtonians who have uh, fought and died in, in wars for our country. Um, and uh, I know that there are folks from the veterans community who are particularly invested in, in saving this uh, as memorial. Um, and, and I would be interested, in addition to our revisiting uh, public comments from the past, in addition to, as Councillor Jeng said, uh, going back to the public for uh, where, where we are now, uh, even community gathering spaces has changed quite a bit with the pandemic and the advent of Zoom and Teams and so on. Um, but in addition to that, I, I would be interested in hearing more about uh, what efforts have been made to find alternative financing resources for Memorial uh, outside of bonding capacity, what, what efforts have been made to find alternative resources for this in the past? And uh, I'm, I'm assuming they haven't been, if they have been there, all that successful because here we are. Um, but again, keeping it in the context of this being a, a, a war memorial uh, in addition to an auditorium, um, th that to me seems it may open some opportunities in itself uh, for some uh, financing outside of uh, taxpayer funds, so or at least local taxpayer funds. Um, so we'd be curious to hear uh, what efforts have been put into that in the past. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Travers. I don't see any others. Um, I would just simply add for myself um, that I agree with the, all of the thoughtful comments that have been made by others around this table um, and uh, do agree that we should, as Councillor Jang said, look beyond just those people that have come to us, although I will say I was um, online for the meeting uh, for the Get It Done Memorial, and there's a lot of real, there's a lot of energy um, and a lot of uh, focus on on keeping memorial, um, and uh, given the people that are organizing that, I have no doubt that they will do everything in their power to, to make that a reality. Um, but there may be others, and there may be others that they can get together with as well. We don't know that unless we unless we do the work to, to find that out. So that's all I would add. Um, if you want to go back to the, um, as far as next steps, maybe you could just lay out what those next steps were. Yeah, I can, I'm not going to share my screen again because I'm Okay. And I don't know, Mayor, I see you look like you were going to add on before I just wrap up the next steps. Why don't you go ahead first, Smith, and maybe I'll just, uh, oh, anything you don't hit, I'll, I'll yeah. finish up with. I think I heard pretty clearly tonight there's not an interest in continuing to explore demolition, so that's a very clear, we're going to, we, again, we have the money so we can move forward with the stabilization, which will definitely be back in front of the council with a, you know, with a contract, you know, we've got to go through a little bit of design and, and, and bid that work, so, um, but I, I heard clearly that that's the desired immediate um, next step, and I think beyond that, um, it's really helpful to get these comments to try and pull together um, the information, the questions that people asked that we weren't able to answer tonight, and to start to think more about what um, what public-private partnership could look like uh, based on what we heard tonight, um, and and bring those back. I think it's helpful to um, understand also. Um, to think, I think it's an opportunity from what I'm hearing tonight to think creatively about how Memorial Auditorium can work within the entire block, and it might be a public-private-private partnership where um, we're bringing together multiple uh, outside stakeholders to, to bring forward a, a vision for the block. And so that's sort of what I see, um, and I think that will hopefully over the next, um, I would say maybe by the end of the summer, be able to come back with the, some more detailed uh, proposals about how we want to move forward with pursuing those options. Pre uh, Mayor Weinberger. Great. I think uh, just a couple additional points. Um, I um, <clears throat> want to be clear as well. The uh, 
I do not support, this administration has not, never supported the demolition of Memorial. Having the updated demolition figures, I think, does uh, clarify what our option is at this point, stabilization or um, spending millions more uh, to have an empty site. Um, we will, as Samantha said, be back shortly um, based, you know, with the uh, feedback we've gotten tonight that I think confirms that path. We'll be back uh, soon to be able to move forward with the stabilization work. I will, I do want to make sure it's clear to anyone watching tonight, and you could kind of see it in all those studies that have been done since 2014. Over the last decade, we have put quite a bit of money into stabilizing the building. This is that's why there's a new roof there. There was a fair amount of masonry work done to keep there from being fallen, falling uh, bricks. This will be a continuation of that, another pushing a million dollars um, per Samantha's <laughs> figures to, uh, to essentially buy us some more time. Um, we also will take the discussion tonight and um, uh, digest it and be back uh, as quickly as possible with some clarity about how we move forward with uh, the potential redevelopment options. Um, I've heard the strong preference for finding a way to save uh, what the public um, expressed support for. Um, in 2018, um, that uh, we've, we've been motivated by that um, strong support for several years. The challenge we face now is whether there is a path that can provide that uh, while given um, the dramatic change in the uh, uh, economics, um, even from what already looked like an extraordinarily tough project where everything needed to go right in 2018, things have deteriorated, things have not gone right since then. They've gotten much, much worse, and that's a reality that we're going to have to grapple with and uh, uh, find a path through together. I do want to make sure to Councillor Traverse's point, it was clear, um, I am fully committed to finding a way to make good on uh, the uh, proper honoring of the, the, the veterans um, that are honored by the plaques in that building. I've been very clear with the VFW that that is a major priority. And that actually, in the number of few things that we felt we can um, definitively say our must-haves, that was one of just the couple up there, is that we have to find a way to do right um, uh, uh, by, by the individuals, the ha families that are um, memorialized. On those plaques, w people may recall, it was um, about, uh, or it was early on in my administration where we actually found and, and brought out of the base memorial auditorium and put back on the display plaques that had been um, kind of lost and kind of hidden for many years, uh, we remain committed to making sure that um, the building, that, that we find a way to properly um, uh, preserve a memorial. And we'll, we'll find a way to do that at the very least. And I hope we can get a lot more done too. Um, and we'll be back soon to talk more about it. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Um, so your plan is to come back to the council in June. Is that correct? I think we probably got, I don't think that we need to be back in June. I think we heard it was pretty definitive that, that we want to move forward with stabilizing the building because uh, the bond has, fine, because we have we know we have the money to do that. I don't think we need to come back until we have an actual proposal to do that, to, you know, to move forward with that work. Okay. I don't think it'll be, that will be ready. Well, we will be back with a proposal and a contract as soon as we get that process finished. Okay. All right, well, as Councillor Travers, I think, pointed out, 2029 is the 100th, 27. was it, uh, yes. 27, um, 20, 27, even 2027 even. was the uh, 100th anniversary, and that gives us five years. Um, and uh, I hope, I, I, I think we probably made our message pretty clear that, you know, we're looking for vision and creativity, clearly with the scarce resources as we always have, so. Um, we'll leave that in your capable hands. And uh, we'll look forward to when you come back to us either later this summer, hopefully later this summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. The, um, we, do have a, we do have the presentation, if we could just have a motion to, um, um, to accept the communication and place it on file. 
So moved. Uh, thank you, Councillor McGee. Is there a second to that motion? Councillor Burke. Oh, Councillor House, thank you so much. Um, all those in favor of the, or is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, so we'll accept that communication. We'll place it on file and look forward to the summer. Um, the next item on our agenda is a presentation regarding redistricting, a discussion and introduction of the redistricting maps for our consideration and community feedback. We have Nancy Stetson, the Senior Policy and Data Analyst, and Megan Tuttle, Director of Planning, back with us for the presentation. And I believe the plan here with this item is to have a short presentation and then discussion from the council. Um, given the hour at now at 7.15, we'll do the presentation, discuss what we can, and then we'll break at 7.30 for public forum and then come back for additional discussion by the council. Um, Nancy, Megan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, and uh, yeah, we'll try to be as brief as possible. Nancy is going to walk through a presentation for all of you that outlines the draft maps that were in your agenda packet, and we'll queue up the discussion. So before I get too far into that, I just wanted to let the counselors know and any... Oh, can you is your microphone on? In green, it would turn green. It is green. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, so you can find the maps we're discussing at burlingtonvt.gov slash redistricting. Um, that highlighted link on the page will take you to a in interactive map where you can see past historical maps and sort of zoom in on details of these maps that I'll be sharing. So just to recap, I'm here because the council uh, asked me to prepare three maps one for a, a seven ward option, an eight ward, and a 12 ward option, uh, with particular emphasis on keeping the new north end and the old north end distinct. There were other um, considerations discussed like compactness and neighborhood integrity, um, and also thinking of a new way to uh, organize Ward 8. So I'm gonna, before I get into the maps, I'm just gonna go through quickly a few uh, constraints um, I met when I was making these maps. The first is that the, the wards, as you expect, have to be basically equal. The courts have decided that basically equal means within 10% uh, of each other by population. Um, the next two items I'll talk about in more detail, but the new north end um, is difficult to make separate from the old North End based on geography and the sort of set population. The other issue is that, that I ran into is that the UVM population counts on the southern campus are not correct. The population isn't allocated to the right blocks, and we know that because we know generally how large the dorms are. Um, so we'll need to dig into that a bit deeper if we want to uh, separate those out. Um, and then finally, uh, we, in talking with other city staff, we, we learned that unique combinations of wards and house districts make uh, elections more complicated for, uh, for the city. So all of these maps that I have made have actually fewer combinations than our current ward map, but it's something to keep in mind as we shift blocks around because a single block that has a different house district in a ward would mean separate scanners, separate ballots for, um, for those polling places. So to talk more in, in more detail, um, I made this map or this chart to illustrate the difficulty of the New North End. So the New North End has a population of 10,686 people. What this chart shows is it, com it compares the relationship between the, the target population of a ward and how many wards uh, there are. So you can see in a four ward map, you would need around 11,000 people in each ward. The black lines behind that, those error bars, are the 5% deviation away from that target. The red lines are the 10% deviation. What this chart is showing is that 
the entire New North End as one ward is within a four ward map that the, within that target population range. Um, but once you split it in half, it falls within an eight ward uh, map, but well below a seven ward map. Um, and then you can see also if you split it into three pieces, it works with either a 12 or a 13 ward. And so those are the only ward configurations where you can keep the new north end completely separate from the old north end. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about the UVM issue, as I mentioned, the blocks don't have the right numbers of, of students in them. Um, we did just receive dorm counts for this time period, so we will be able to figure out our actual um, population according to those blocks. The other thing to know about this part of the city is that the, the blocks are quite large. So the largest one, the largest block is the living and learning and the athletic campus, and that's around 2,500 people. Um, and so wherever that block goes will very much affect the rest of the map. So now I'll get into the actual maps. The first map we have um, is a seven word option. Um, I made a few choices here. You can see that the new north end is split generally between the north and the south. Um, I think one thing to note about this sort of configuration is that the, the bulk of the population in the new north end is actually concentrated in that northern section. And so any southern uh, new north end ward would be much larger in land area, but those populations are approximately equal. Also worth noting that this ward reaches into the old north end and takes up a, a fairly large section of sort of the north uh, western old north end. Um, the UVM blocks you can see are those southern, that southern campus is in ward six, and then ward three becomes sort of a, more of a downtown ward. And this just gives you some detail about what that, what that ward would look like. And again, I think it might be easier to look at those dynamic maps that Nancy shared that have uh, the ability to zoom in and you can see street names and all that information as well. So for the eight ward options, I made two different versions. The first I made just to show how you could change the wards as little as possible and get to an allowable deviation. So here, all the wards are practically the same as what we currently have. There's you know, one block from Ward 4 that moves to Ward 7, um, and then blocks are shifted around Ward 8 to make that um, ward work. But generally, uh, they're in line with the current wards. And there's some more detail. For the next uh, Ward 8 option, uh, I once again tried to split the new north end sort of more into a northern and southern section, though this one's sort of diagonal, um, and then shifted Ward 8 more into the center of the city, so Ward 3 and Ward 8 sort of share the downtown. Ward 1 and Ward 5 are generally the same, where Ward 2 takes up most of the old north end north of North Street. Uh, and Ward 6, again, has the UVM blocks in it. For the 12 ward option, um, this, I would say, is the most drastic change from what we have now. The ward numbers don't match um, what the ward numbers are now. Um, so you can see there's three wards in the new north end. Um, there's sort of a similar uh, Ward 1 that's now, now called Ward 4 that takes that uh, sort of e most eastern section. Ward 8 is actually just two blocks on UVM campus. Um, again, those blocks aren't quite correct because of the population errors, but this is what I was working with. Ward 6 is, is similar, the, the hill section, um, and you, you can see the rest here. I'll show the detail. Um, I would say this, if, if, a 12, if there's particular interest in a 12 ward map, there could be a lot more iterations of this. Um, this is sort of a first pass, but 
a 12 word map is more difficult to make because the deviations are smaller. Each word has to be around uh, three, within like 300 people of, of the others. So it, single blocks make big differences. Um, and those are the options that we've put together. So happy to answer questions. And do you wanna to go to your next slide? So just oh. in thinking about how um, some helpful feedback that Nancy could receive at this point, she also shared a couple of questions here for you. Uh, the first is just you know reactions to your feedback on the number of words that you requested in these various maps. Um, and then if you would like to continue to move forward with um, some of the maps, there are specific questions about uh, how you think the wards should be divided, particularly in the New North End, um, any questions or suggestions that you have about the division of the campus area, south of Main Street in particular, um, and any other considerations that the council has for Nancy to continue to iterate. Thank you, thanks very much for this helpful presentation. This is a, a complex issue. We started with Memorial, now we're going on to redistricting both difficult, difficult topics. Um, and thank you for these key questions because hopefully these can help to guide us, to guide us and to guide you as well. Um, uh, just also wanted to acknowledge, even though you can't see it on the screen, um, uh, that we do have another counselor. Counselor Freeman has just joined us um, on, on Zoom. Um, it is now 7.25. Uh, we do have a couple of people that wish to speak during public forum, um, but we do have a little bit of time if counselors do, if anyone has any comments that they would like to share with us at this time, and then we would go to public forum after. Counselor Bergman. I have a, a just a, a quick question related to the numbers, and I'm particularly interested in the eight ward uh, option two. And, and, but the question is whether you kept these to census blocks and whether you have also taken a look at splitting census blocks as the city attorney indicated in his memo, we can do. Um, I, I don't know in terms of the practicality of that, but legality, it's sort of like what he said in terms of the deviations, we can actually go over uh, we could hit 11% if we've got a good reason for it. It's not quite as presumptively right, but if there were good reasons to go to 11 or 12%, uh, I, 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 his memo made clear what I thought was the case. Um, so that's a question. I'll, I'll leave the comments given the time of, uh, of day to just try to get an answer to that. For the initial maps, I did not split any blocks. Um, I took away from that memo that it would be possible, um, but I would need council direction about which blocks you would like to split in order to make certain ward configurations work. Uh, let me end by saying that uh, I see the potential to uh, even out the, the deviation between ward two and three in that, uh, in, in that option two. It seems that we've got room to do it and, uh, and actually maybe even lower the deviation on there and make that map more reasonable. If I could just add one piece of follow-up information. Um, I think the city attorney's memo was really helpful in clarifying that we could use a smaller unit of measure than the census blocks. In some parts of the city, the census blocks are literally a city block and they might be quite small. Um, in order for us to be able to move forward with reliably splitting those, we would need to have some way to know what the occupancy of the individual buildings within those blocks was. Um, I think that in some parts of the city, this is an easier kind of challenge, like understanding bed counts on, on campus at UVM um, or Champlain College, but in private residences, that becomes a much more difficult challenge. Thank you and understood. Thanks very much, Councilor Bergman. Um, We've, we've brought ourselves to 7.30, so um, if it's okay, we'll just, if you can just sit, sit, a, sit on off to the side and we'll do the public forum. Um, and uh, we have a few people that are here to speak to public forum, as well as a couple of people that are here online. Um, before we begin the public forum, 
just a few pieces of information. Uh, for those who participate in person, the system on the table in front of us has three lights. Uh, there's a green light that'll shine be when you begin speaking, a, a second yellow light when you have about 30 seconds left, and then the last, red, last light is red, and that will shine when your time is up. Um, we ask that you please complete your comments when um, the sound indicates that your time is up so that everyone has the same amount of time to speak. Um, and also so we can keep the public forum moving along. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we have um, people here in person as well as people that are participating via Zoom. Um, and we have a hybrid system for public forum. So the way that it works is that um, those people who are participating um, via Zoom have filled out a form online. You can still, can still fill out that form. Um, it is burlingtonvt.gov slash public forum. And the information that you put in that form will come into a spreadsheet that I can see so that I can call on you. Um, if you are here in person and wish to speak during public forum, there are sheets um, to, I'm so bad with directions, so, 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 um, uh, that are to my right, that are to your left um, at the table. You are going in the right direction <laughs> um, that are here right in the back of the room. Um, and you can fill those fill those in and then just give them to the clerk at the front of the t front next near me and uh, she will bring them to me. Um, and the way that we do this is Burlington residents have first priority. So we'll go to Burlington residents that are here in Contois, then Burlington residents via Zoom, then back to Contois for non-Burlington residents and we will wrap up with um, non-Burlington residents that are here via Zoom. Um, and the only request that we have is that when you're speaking during public forum, um, that you be mindful of the fact that there are many community members that watch public forum and watch our city council meeting. Please um, try to use respectful language and also please direct your comments to me as the chair. Um, we do have we do have two people that wish to speak during public forum that are in Contois. The first is Diana Carlisle, and the second is uh, Chris Hasley. Um, I, Hasley? Hasley. Um, Ms. Carlisle, thank you so much for being here. Um, so you'll have two minutes to speak, and uh, please make yourself comfortable, and then the clock will start when you start speaking. Sure, first. And just make sure that you make sure that the green light is on on the microphone right in front of you. Yes, yes it is. Thank you, uh, Diana Carlisle. Um, <clears throat> I'm speaking about the short-term rental uh, resolution that's before you. Um, as you know, I'm pretty keen on this subject, having watched a home on our street be bought um, and turned into a whole house rental with no owner occupancy. And it isn't the first one I found out. I, there was some other one too. But anyway, I see you have a resolution and it can start enforcing. And I mean start, because I don't think there's been, well, I won't put my own. Anyway, it, make sure that enforcement, because it's, an illeg it's illegal to not have an owner-occupied house that's being rented short term. And so that would be a very good thing to do to get some enforcement mechanisms and to set a date if somebody doesn't comply with it. Um, we're having a real problem with STRs all over the country. Um, people are investing. Um, the stock market is not a good place for your money, and it's only going to get worse. And I really worry about Burlington, and I hope we can get a handle on this. Not all STRs are bad. Some are very good, and they help people, and they've gone through the right process, and they've been approved. But others are taking advantage, and they are not having to to, to, to come forth and um, they've got notice of violations, but it still goes on and I really hope that you'll take some action. I don't see it as wasted effort, even though I know you continue to work on this project because I think an enforcement mechanism is a very good step. It's, I think many people say no owner occupancy is something you all agree on, that owners must own. So, this will be clear and the enforcement can find that and it can do something about it and you can find what the places are that you may have to uh, work on in your in your um, further deliberations so i think it's something that would be useful and extremely important important so thank you very much 
Thank you so much for those comments. Uh, our next speaker is Chris Hazley, and I don't have any others that are within, that are in ConChoice. Um, if you could fill out a form, did you, you did. Okay, thank you so much. Chris, go ahead, please. Thank you, Councilor Paul. Um, like to say thanks to all the counselors that have had time to chat with us in the, the map making community that have either uh, met in person or by phone or responded via email. Certainly, I appreciate the opportunity. If I haven't talked to you, uh, I'm going to make that effort here in the, the very near future. Um, just wanted to follow up. I think that our analysis was very much uh, congruent with Ms. Stetson's analysis regarding the challenges of maintaining the old north end and the new north end border. Uh, due to the, the mathematics involved, as well as the similar issues uh, over uh, on the UVM Athletic Campus. And regardless of what the final maps look like, I think that anyone who has rolled up their sleeves and done the mapping has run into the challenges presented uh, by the census blocks, the fact that they vary in size from a low of 20 to a large of over 2,600. Um, the lack of consistency, both in size, shape, and, uh, makes it difficult to tweak the maps at any kind of granular or detail level. So I think that it might be helpful um, at the end of the process to debrief and convene a meeting of the interested parties to maybe send uh, communication to the census folks with some suggestions on how those blocks might be drawn a little bit better the, the next time around. So um, secondly, um, I think you've all seen the maps. I'm not gonna sit here and plug the maps. I think you've seen them before. I will say that upon review of the city attorney's memo, uh, it would appear that the maps that the independent mapping group uh, have put forth uh, may be over the 10% uh, deviation for the threshold. So don't be surprised if you see a couple of revised versions coming your way uh, to address those contingencies. Um, it looks like I'm getting down on time, so I will uh, yield the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so there are two speakers who, in Conchoice Burlington residents who wish to speak. The first is David Shine to be followed by Todd LaCroix. Uh, thank you, City Council, for uh, having public forums. I want to speak about Memorial Auditorium. I don't know if the work session was open, but I didn't read it right if it was. Um, I've been involved in uh, Save Memorial Auditorium for a while. I grew up two blocks from it. Um, as far as I know, I don't know what happened in your work session, it was deeded to the people of Burlington as a public trust, as a civic auditorium. And to privatize it or to consider privatizing that site and that building is a real violation of trust and of the deed of Memorial Auditorium. I would hope that you would really consider that possible violation of trust in making that space and that building private. It's a public auditorium. Also, as an artist, as a performer, as a sometime musician, this city is completely lacking in a civic auditorium. This is it, folks. And a town of our size with the amount of performing artists and schools and people who use, who, who used to use Memorial Auditorium for I don't know, 100 years, 80 years, I forget. To not have one is just a travesty in a town this size. I ran an arts council in Western New York. I've been involved in uh, Chicago in the Department of Cultural Affairs. And to not provide for your performers, this town's great for visual artists. And you got festivals where people can play in the street. But to support a place where performing artists and students, is that my, is that my sign? That, that you don't have that is just, unconscionable in a town this size. Places like Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and Missoula, Montana would be up, appalled to think that Burlington doesn't have that. So please think about providing for your performers, your students, your schools, and having a civic auditorium that is a public space as it was deeded. And there's a big movement now, um, and we're gathering money, and uh, we'll probably be seeing you again. Thank you so much, and thank you for honoring the time, David. Uh, our next speaker is Todd LaCroix. I agree with what he just said. Now, let me remind you guys that you're all scared about all this uh, policing and all this violence going on on the streets. Let me remind you of what happened to me 10 years ago during Occupy. The man who shot himself out here in the tent 
who uh, was the excuse as to why they shut down Occupy all across the country. Well, I know that you allowed journalism to die, so you never got told this, but he was an undercover asset. And he accidentally killed himself. It wasn't intentional. And he was there to mess with me for trying to peacefully improve our country. Now, let me remind you that what's going on in the streets is just a continuation of what's been happening since January 6th. It's still playing out on our streets, except the difference is, is that you people are ignoring the reasons and the causes, and you're blaming vagrants and poor people for what was clearly the people who, during Occupy Wall Street, were empowered at going after people like me and treating people like me and citizens violently, aggressively, in the very same way that they are now going after Democrats. And let me remind you, it's the same people. I watched as you applauded them when they did it to me during Occupy and ignored the abuse that they were doing to me for years. And now, they're coming for you too? Let me remind you, I've been on the front lines of fighting for your rights, not just mine and that you're selling out your souls. And because journalism is dead, you people are having psychopaths control your freedom of speech and your information. And you're literally letting them run you around and destroy your communities. And you're still supporting them. You're allowing them to do this because you don't want to talk about the reasons and the issues at the heart of it all. Thank you, Todd. Uh, we don't have anyone else who has signed up to speak in public forum from Burlington in Contois, except for one person who I believe is just finishing a form. And that is Phil Carlton, is that correct? Um, I apologize. Could you tell, are you, are you from Shelburne? I am from Shelburne. Okay. Um, we actually have um, Burlington residents going first. Um, and so we then go on to Burlington residents that are joining us via Zoom. So if you can just hold those thoughts for a couple of minutes and I'll come right back to you. Thank you. Um, we have a few people that are online that are Burlington residents, and so we will go to them. The first uh, person online is, um, is Linda Rizvi, and Linda, uh, I have found you and have enabled your microphone if you'd like to speak now. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go okay. ahead. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Rizvi, and I live in Ward 8. I'll be reading my comments. I'm here to focus on two redistricting concerns, and I'd like to ask you to keep both of them front and center as you do your worst trading. The first issue is that the new map should not be gerrymandered. I'm sure you're aware of the principles of redistricting to avoid gerrymandering. One of them is called compactness, which means that individual wards should be compact in appearance on the map. But Ward 8 looks like the wings of a bird. Bird wings are an excellent indicator that gerrymandering has occurred. This needs to be corrected. The second issue is that the majority, but not all, of Ward 8 voters live, work, and study at an institution, UVM, that doesn't allow equitable access for campaigning by candidates running for office. This results in a structural disadvantage for any candidate not affiliated with the university. As has been described in detail elsewhere, there are special rules regarding campus access, including to residential units by individuals not affiliated with UVM. These rules make perfect sense for UVM as an institution, but they create a unique and democratic situation. Imagine you're campaigning or you want to run for office and you live in a ward where the majority of the voters live in a neighborhood, but you don't have the same access to them for grassroots campaigning as your opponent who lives there. 
and you have obstacles and hoops to jump through that your opponent doesn't have. Sadly, this isn't imaginary. I tend to believe that this undemocratic structural disadvantage that's been built into our war resulted as an unintended consequence of the last redistricting. But now we know the consequence, and I hope you'll all agree with me that it would be indefensible to repeat it. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. The next person um, online to speak during public forum is Maddie Posig. Maddie, I have found you and enabled your, enabled your microphone if you would like to speak. Sure, and you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Sure, so my name is Maddie Posig. I live on Hungerford Terrace in Ward 8. I've lived here for over 40 years, and I would also like to speak to the city council about redistricting and about Ward 8 in particular. My neighbors and I have been concerned about the makeup of Ward 8 since it was created in 2015. Ward 8, as it currently exists, has several problems. Since the majority of the residents in this ward live in UVM dorms, any non-student is forbidden to campaign door-to-door -door in the dorms. It is equally difficult to get signatures to run for office in this ward for the same reason. In addition, due to the transient nature of students who live in dorms, it has been challenging to find candidates to run for office in Ward 8. It has also been very difficult to find poll workers. I was aware that myself and my neighbors found our ward problematic. However, I was surprised to see that changing the configuration of Ward 8 was the number one priority of residents throughout Burlington as found by the redistricting committee that was tasked by this council. So my neighbors and I are looking to you, the city council, to reconfigure Ward 8 so that it has a more balanced makeup. The student population should be evenly distributed throughout the city, not concentrated in one single ward. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. The next, uh, next person uh, to speak during public forum is Andrea Rogers. Andrea, I have found you and enabled your microphone and you can begin speaking. Actually, I wasn't in, I, I sent in some comments. I wasn't really planning to speak, although I might just quickly say, I mean, I live on South Union Street. We've always been in Ward 6. Um, in uh, changing to Ward 5 wouldn't be terrible, but the plan number 12 um, breaking it up into much smaller units uh, creates this unit sort of that's half the sisters and half part of South Union Street. But, you know, it kind of loses the history of both wards. And uh, also there's no polling place there. And, and the whole concept of having so many more, uh, much smaller wards, to me, just it, it doesn't make good economic or management sense because of what it adds to the whole process of voting. So th those are essentially my comments. I would prefer it, the eight, number eight, but I could accept number seven um, in the plan. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, with that, we have one other person online. They are a non-Burlington resident, so we go back to Contois. And one person who is who wants to speak, and that is that is you, sir, uh, Phil Carlton. Uh, please go ahead. And I don't know if you got here before we had started. We have a, a timer system in front of you. When you start speaking, the green light will go on, and you have two minutes. Thanks so much. I've been working downtown. Uh, sir, right in front of you is a little button, and the green light will go on. Go. Thank you. Yeah, I've been working at Burlington's downtown transit center for a couple of years since before the pandemic, and the situation there has been getting steadily worse, and it's getting to the point where many of the elderly people that come through there are terrified to be around there. They're even terrified to be on the buses. It's gotten completely out of hand, 
and I think you're entirely missing the source of the problem. Um, there's this pattern that's been noticed as long as 3,500 years ago, which is that when the judiciary gets corrupt or unresponsive, people choose to go with a monarchy or empire instead of taking the judiciary back and saying, you have to work for us. And that's exactly what we're going through in this country. That is, um, President Trump shows a lot of signs of wanting to be king. The book, The Imperial Presidency, was written in Nixon's time, talking about how we were getting to that point. So it's been a pattern that's been going on for a very long time. And once you go to a monarchy, it's very hard to get back. That is, the Roman Empire never came back. In the Hebrew scriptures, once they had a king, they had 300 and some kings, most of whom were terrible. Um, in Germany, we reestablished the peace after, after they, they lost their democracy. And that has lasted a while, but you know, the, that movement is coming back again. So our freedom is being lost right here in this room by Democrats and, and progressives who are not doing the job of making the judiciary responsive to the people. There's no consequence for the kind of behavior that's totally unacceptable that goes on all the time at the downtown transit center. And that's something you have to fix, but it's not gonna be fixed with the police. It'll be fixed only if you fix the judiciary so there's actually a consequence for what happens. Thank you so much. We will go back to on uh, back to on Zoom uh, speakers on Zoom, um, and the only speaker we have signed up who's a non Burlington resident is J. P. Cozano, Cozano, uh, and I have enabled your microphone so you're able to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I spoke actually earlier at the finance uh, meeting and just wanted to reiterate to any of the councilmen who hadn't been able to join that. Um, I, uh, my family owns 100 Main Street, uh, North Star Sports. We've been there for over 30 years. Um, I am excited about the Main Street re redesign um, or you know, revitalization, but I am definitely concerned about redesigning the parking. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who are loading and unloading bikes, you know, purchasing bikes, things like that. Um, and um, just to do that is hard for them to walk multiple blocks with either a broken bike or loading a bike into a car. So parking is definitely very important, um, especially when we're getting out and actually helping the people unload bikes. And if it's an e-bike, they're extremely heavy. Um, and generally they have car racks on them, which makes their, their, you know, their vehicle a little bit longer. Um, and frankly, I've not, you know, none of the businesses on Main Street have heard anything from the city or designers, consultants about what's going on. I just randomly had gotten all this info that this was happening about this vote. Um, so before voting, I would like you know the city to start talking to some businesses and I know you're on a time crunch for it, but to get a meeting and like sit down and let us know like exactly where we're losing parking, if we're losing it, how much, is there ways around it? Um, you know, cause you know, again, we're the, it's pretty important for us, um, especially for what we do. We don't have, you know, we don't have bags with a, you know, we don't sell a lot of just a piece of clothing that someone can walk five blocks with, with a, you know, in a bag. Um, and I know my counterpart across the street, Zandi um, at the ski rack, you know, feels pretty strongly about um, the parking issue as well. Um, I appreciate all you guys' uh, time and uh, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have anyone else who signed up for the public forum. Um, just give this another co couple of seconds here. Uh, there's anyone in Contois or anyone online who wishes to speak during public forum. With that, we will close the public forum at 7.50. Oh, okay, sure. You can do it after if you'd like. <laughs> Welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Brad Wiltfong. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and I'm sorry to jump in last minute. Um, I'd like to step in and voice my support for the changes to Main Street in terms of uh, uh, bike lanes and making it more walkable and bikeable. Um, I think in regard to the owner of the businesses in, in those areas, 
if there is more ability and ease to get to downtown by biking or walking, the parking that is available will be more open to those businesses. And I think it's important, especially as we move forward into a future where personal automobiles cannot be the dominant form of transportation, that we make progress as a city to make biking and walking easier and safer. So Eugene Bergman, or Jean Bergman, is my representative in Ward 2, and I would ask that you please vote yes as we move forward into that vote. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. And then if you could just fill that out so we have that, that would be great. Um, is there anyone else? Seeing none, uh, we'll close the public forum at 7.55. And before we go back to the discussion on redistricting, we do have two other items of business, and those are um, item four, five. Item five, item five is the climate emergency reports. Is there any counselor, or does the administration wish to offer a climate emergency report? Seeing none, we'll close that item and continue to item six, which is our consent agenda. Um, is there a motion uh, to move our consent ad agenda and take the actions indicated? Thank you, Councillor Bergman. Is there a second to that motion? Councillor Shannon, thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda and taking the actions indicated, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Any opposed? We have approved our consent agenda, which will bring us to the deliberative agenda. Um, just so we can all plan accordingly, we have three items on our deliberative agenda uh, due to the discussion that we already began on redistricting and the public forum where we did get some comments on redistricting. We'll go to item 7.01, and when we finish that, we'll break to convene the local control commission um, in case there are any applicants that are here so they don't have to wait too long, and then we'll return to the rest of our deliberative agenda. So with that, if Megan and Nancy, if you could come back and um, uh, we, I'm, I'm, did we get in the, In the, uh, um, I don't recall that in the process of doing the redistricting that that, that, that items, w was the item, was the slide with the key questions, that is in the, that is the, the very end of the item that, of the item, the uh, PDF that we have. Yes, uh, Nancy did send the slides to Lori this afternoon to post and the key questions are at the end of that document. But we could also pull them back up on the screen if you'd like as well. Okay, so ba based on what we, what we can manage to cover this evening and getting feedback, then we'll figure out next steps um, because we really don't know exactly what we're gonna get and what information we're gonna be able to give you, Nancy, so that you can continue your work. Um, are there counselors who have comments or feedback to offer either on the four uh, key questions or just in, or maybe there were five? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Sees, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Hansen, please go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, I guess I'll do my question first. So my question is, if, if we went to a 12 ward system, would that require us legally or otherwise to have a polling place in each of the 12 new wards? That's, that's not a question I can answer. Yeah, I think that um, we can also, the uh, Justin St. James wasn't able to be here tonight, and so he did also ask us to take down any questions that are legal questions. Um, but I believe one of the considerations was to make sure there's a polling location. I'm not sure that that's a must have, um, or if polling locations can be shared, but we can confirm that okay. with the city council, or uh, with the city attorney. Okay, great, thank you. And I guess my comment is just to reiterate and now having seen the maps, um, you know, my support for the 12 ward system, I think there's a lot of benefits to it. We could keep the council the same size, but really have a more 
equitable system where each counselor represents the same number of people and where people are represented in a much more hyper-local way. Um, and I think it avoids some of the, it would avoid some of the debates and controversies that um, come with trying to figure out a seven or an eight ward um, map. But I've spoken at length about this in the past, so I'll try not to just repeat and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Hansen. Uh, Councillor Carpenter. Thanks. Um, I just want to let the council know that um, sort of irrelevant of, of the redistricting, I've asked the Charter Change Committee and the City Attorney to look at what we would need to do if we could share um, polling places. And this is coming up just because of an issue in our end of town where one of our polling places is, is a church and is, it's somewhat problematic. So. Um, it wasn't, the city attorney is going to get back to us about whether we can do it by ordinance or whether we have to do it by charter. But I think personally we should take that consideration off of the table because we're doing so much mail in ballots and there may be other good reasons to share polling places. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. We have Councillor House. Uh, please go away. Go. <laughs> Please go ahead. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was like, oh, uh, leave the meeting? What? Um, um, yeah, so um, thank you, President Paul. I um, just wanted to say, you know, being the um, Ward 8 uh, representative, I definitely, um, you know, have, have seen kind of firsthand some of the, um, the, the challenges that present with um, you know, running a campaign in that ward, some of the um, inequities that occur um, in the district. And um, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I want to say that uh, the, um, you know, I, I do think that it is important to um, engage the student population in local government. I don't think um, the right way to go about doing that um, is to have a gerrymandered district, but I do think um, that it's worth in this conversation um, considering ways where, you know, as we create more equitable wards, how can we continue to um, engage the student population because part of um, being a good neighbor and being a good citizen is engaging in local government. And I think that um, UVM, uh, does uh, not do a great job of encouraging students to engage in that way. And so I do think uh, it is critical that we as a city, as we're redistricting, also ask ourselves um, how we can um, bring, bring some of the issues that we are aware of to the consciousness of people on campus. Thanks very much, Councillor House. Uh, Councillor House, I owe you a cup of coffee the next time we're together in person. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, President. That's quite all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Hightower to be uh, followed by Councillor Travers. Um, yeah, I think that this is going to be hard because we're not probably going to come to as much consensus as we should or as you would hope. Um, I think the I think the 12 ward map is hard. I like the hyper local, but I think it, it it's also very small, and I think people will feel. Um, to some extent, a little bit more cut off. I do prefer the 12 ward over some compromise thing where we've got districts again or anything else like that, which I think is not a good pathway forward. Um, in terms of the eight ward maps, I think we should abandon <laughs> the like try the one where we just tried to update our current plan, which because I think it's not a non continuous kind of ward eight. I don't think that's. Um, the plan that we should go with, whereas the second one is a better option. But again, I don't know what that Ward 8 map would look like in terms of counselors. I don't want to go back or want to continue having the districts. Um, I didn't hate the Ward 7 map, but I know a lot of other counselors did. But I think that gives us a good option for having some of the priorities that we had of having more of a downtown core, but also um, having two counselors per ward. So I would be in favor of the Ward 7 and the Ward 12 maps. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Councillor Travers, to be followed by Councillor Barlow. Thank you, President Paul. <clears throat> I suppose just beginning with a question I think many of us have heard and we heard today again in public forum from uh, representatives from the group who have been advocating for a downtown ward. And I'm just wondering if you can speak to whether or not 
you have seen the maps proposed by that group and if you've looked into this prospect of, of, of what this group has referred to as a downtown ward? Yeah, um, from what I've seen of their maps, I, I think they had a similar sort of ward three downtown. Um, I would say the main difference between the map that I've seen from them and uh, the maps that I made is that they included that athletic campus block in Ward 1, which then led them to move the sort of Riverside Avenue neighborhood into Ward 2 because of that. Things have to shift if you split up those UVM blocks. Um, so that's what I took away as sort of the, the main difference between our maps. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple other comments. First of all, thank you for all the work you've put into this. It strikes me as this is not uh, easy work. Uh, so really appreciate all the time that you've put into it. Um, I, I really wholly agree with the comments made by Councillor Hightower. I recognize the value uh, potentially to be found in a Ward 12 map, but as we discussed at our last meeting on this, I think that uh, many folks in Burlington feel quite a bit of Ward identity. Uh, as someone who's been five years on the Ward 5 NPA, uh, I know that our NPAs in particular go back some time, and, and, and I don't know that um, voters are, are, are ready to um, go too far from uh, the structure that we have right now. Uh, like Councillor Hightower, I, I also don't mind um, the Ward 7 map, um, uh, the 7 Ward map. Um, if we were to continue with an 8 Ward map, though, I also prefer uh, option 2. Um, to answer the questions that you presented on the New North End, I would really defer to my colleagues from the New North End as to uh, the East-West Divide or the uh, North-South Divide. Um, and uh, on, on the other questions here, um, uh, UVM campus, I appreciate your looking into that uh, and, and perhaps providing us some updated numbers. I suppose in looking at the maps myself, I know that at the last meeting we talked about perhaps not wanting to align local wards with the new house districts, but in looking at this from a very much bird's eye view, it appears that there may be some wards that are maybe just a block off or so from where the house districts are. And so if there is a way to align some of the boundaries with uh, existing or, or new house and Senate districts, um, perhaps not the whole ward itself, uh, but if there's a southern boundary or a directional boundary one way or another that could be aligned uh, there, it may provide for some simplicity. Um, I suppose the, the last question that I would present to the council, though, is that uh, I think whether we go with a seven ward or eight ward map, a big question here is going to be the, the size of the council. Um, and uh, uh, I, I uh, fr from my own perspective, am, am not opposed to uh, increasing the size of the council, but I think proceeding one way or another with a seven ward or eight ward map will require some guidance from this council as to, uh, as to that question as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Travers. Uh, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. And uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I just, my questions were more, I had a clarifying question about the updated dorm counts. Did that, so you found there were, um, there were inaccuracies in the counting, and so did that, did that affect the overall citywide count, or they were just where, where the, where the students were counted? Yeah, so it seems like the, the students are just counted in the wrong block. Like, so there's one block that doesn't have any dorms in it, but has 1,200 students allocated to that block. And so clearly those students should belong in other blocks. We just need the dorm counts to figure out which ones. And this is something we picked up on this year because it was actually an error that happened in 2010 originally. So we had discovered this problem with the misallocation and had been able to clarify it and properly account for it in the process of developing the maps in 2015. Uh, so we had proactively reached out to the University of Vermont to get their bed counts as of March 2020 so that we can clarify this data again. So it's not something that's insurmountable and it doesn't affect the city's population overall. Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, then I, my next question was around um, the new North End division in the um, version two of the eight ward map. There was a decision made to divide the new North End north-south instead of the way it currently is, east-west. Um, and I'm just wondering about the thinking that went into that. Was it around aligning with 
having less permutations of house and and um, and local ward uh, combinations, or was it a, around some other factor? Okay. Um, Councillor Hightower requested us uh, to see that division, um, and so I was trying it out. I personally am not that familiar with the New North End as a neighborhood, so I don't know sort of where the sort of more, like where the neighborhood groupings lie. Um, so that was something I tried out. I think you can see from the, the two Ward 8 options, the overall New North End division is the same, so either of those would work with any other ward combination. I think what, just one thing to add to that, though, is I think with the, the overall grouping of maps that you have, you can see different ways to divide between wards four and seven. And part of that is just trying to get equality between wards four and seven, especially if those two wards are to represent that neighborhood. Ward four has been growing faster than ward seven, and so in any configuration, uh, some portion of Ward 7 would have to come across the west side of the avenue to get population either from the far north end or the far south end of the neighborhood. So in, it was in part as a result of a request, but I think if you've seen lots of the different maps that have been floating out there from other groups too, people have just been looking at different ways to think about how to divide the population in, in the new north end. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I would, I would uh, echo the comments of Councillor Travers. I think the the least amount of change that we can make and also achieve the objectives of the redistricting process um, would be the least controversial. So I would, I would at least like to entertain um, a notion of a uh, east-west split in the new north end for wards four and, and seven if we did an eight ward map or even a seven ward map for that, for that matter. And that's all I have for now. Great, thank you, Councillor Barlow. Um, Councillor Carpenter. I, I just want to echo that, that what Councillor Barlow said, and clarify that you, between the two options of the eight, the one and the two, they're a little bit interchangeable, if those two words. Thank you. Thanks, yes, Councillor yes, Carpenter. As as, oh, go sorry. ahead. Um, to be clear, yes. the. Between options one and two of the eight ward map, the new north end options could be interchangeable. On the seven ward map, um, I gotta find it here. Um, where we go? Is, are there still options of sort of within the two wards going more north in one and more south in another? I mean, I, I don't know how the blocks work, obviously, but. Yes, I think that's okay. possible. I think you could shift some of that for, but again, with, with the Ward 7, you would need to get Understood that people. it's, yeah, understood. Yeah, from the old north end. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I uh, am grateful for the work that you all put in to uh, bring these maps. Um, in looking at them, I think I... I like the 12 ward option more and more. Um, I, you know, hear the concerns that some folks have shared about some neighborhoods being split up and um, would like to see uh, other iterations of that um, that maybe address some of those concerns. But it does seem to me that um, a 12 ward option uh, gives us the closest thing to a downtown ward while also preserving uh, the Old North End neighborhoods. Um, I am concerned about the options that uh, sort of pull part of the Old North End into the New North End or uh, have part of the Old North End uh, combined with um, parts of the Hill section in downtown. Um, I think it would be important for us to um, maintain uh, those, that neighborhood integrity. So um, that's sort of where I'm at right now. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, are there any other, count Councillor Shannon? Thank you, President Paul. Um, thank you for all of this work. It's very helpful. And I wondered if it's possible to work with that um, independent mapping group, I had asked them for 
a PDF of the map just so I, I could see it better. I found it hard to work with it how, how the way it was presented and they couldn't figure out a way to do that and I wondered if that is something that um, the PDFs that you you provided us I found to be the most helpful in my ability to look at it. Um, something strange happened on board docs. I had all the documents there and that they've now disappeared so I don't know what the four questions are. I apologize. Um, but I'll just go along the lines of speaking about the things that everybody else is speaking about. Uh, I have a concern that some, particularly with the 12 ward map, um, in an effort to achieve compactness, I think it makes a lot of sense to have a district right around UVM campus. But in terms of the functions of governance, I think it has been brought to our attention that it doesn't work very well because they have a lot of trouble getting people to fill all of the positions that need to be filled within a ward. Um, I would also note that I really appreciate counselors, Counselor House's comments about engaging students and I completely agree with that. Um, my daughter is a college student currently not at UVM. Um, but I think I, I love to talk with that peer group um, about our local top politics and I do think they're pretty engaged, you know, some of them at least are quite engaged. But even when they're engaged, they actually have an option, like by definition, if they're living on campus, they do have another home. And they do have another option about where they vote. And I know trying to register many of them in Burlington, they often have reasons why they choose to vote um, in their home residence rather than in Burlington. And that, that includes both our Vermont students, students coming from Vermont, as well as out-of-state students. Um, and consequently, we have an extraordinarily low voter turnout from our current gerrymandered Ward 8 for the students. Well, the result of that is that um, counselors will get elected by far fewer voters. And so the weight of each voter in those districts is more than in a high turnout district like the New North End. And so I do think that there is a justifiable reason to potentially make those wards larger to encompass more people to go outside um, the deviation there. Uh, I think um, having lived in both Ward 3 and in Ward 7, and I didn't move, um, the way I look at the compactness question is, if I live in any part of this district, can I get elected? <laughs> or am I not electable just based on where I live? So what I, I mean is, I don't mean based on my politics, but I know that somebody ran on Lakeview Terrace for a Ward 7 seat, and the fact that he lived on Lakeview Terrace was used against him, I think effectively, in the campaign. And so um, I realize that some people don't want to change their wards because they have an identity with that ward. But more importantly, I think when we're looking at changing people from wards, I, I'd like to ask a question. Can you get elected from where you are in your new ward? Or is there some reason that you can't? Um, and so for that reason, I do have, and I appreciate, I, I have done these mapping exercises and I appreciate how difficult it is to make the numbers work and that we're all going to have to make some compromises on the various things that we want. But I am very concerned about the maps that just take Lakeview Terrace out, put it in the new North End. Um, and for that reason, I actually kind of think that the seven ward map um, 
addresses that electability question a little bit better because you have enough concentration in the old north end that you can't alienate everybody in a section of the ward as not being one of us. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Shannon. Um, are there others who wish to speak even on a second round if there's others? It appears as though, I don't know, have we, have we given you a reasonable amount of information? I sort of feel like we've, a number of us have tried to give you some of our either personal preferences or based on constituent needs, um, based on the city's needs. Um, do you feel that, for example, with the question of the number of wards, you've heard from uh, three of the of the people that have given you feedback, three who are supportive of the 12 ward map, others who are more supportive of the seven or eight. Um, and then as far as the division of the new North End, um, you've heard from a couple of counselors who represent those constituents that there is a concern and a desire to see that map in another configuration, um, uh, at least of the few that, you know, of, of two of the three that have offered that um, feedback. And then um, as far as merging the new North End and the old North End, it appears as though the majority um, probably would prefer not to. However, there are those that feel the seven ward map for a variety of reasons would be an alternative. Um, so I'm just wondering if you if you feel that you've got a little bit more to go on than you did when you when we started. I think that um, the feedback specifically about some of the questions about the new North End split and the combination of the new North End and old North End are, are helpful and I do think that there are pieces of that that um, Nancy could take back and use to at least to narrow down some of the eight ward options with regard to the new North End. Um, I think, you know, in terms of how many comments we heard about the different configurations in terms of seven, eight, or 12, I heard a fair amount of similarity between people who like the options and people who see one or the other as problematic. So. Um, I'm not sure that I heard enough clarity in terms of being able to narrow down um, from the three different sizes to maybe two sizes. Um, so not sure that we have much clarity to move forward for, with on that part. And, and could I just, I just wanted to make one clarification about the request on the UVM dorms. Um, what I was hoping to get, or to get feedback on is where, less about the, the inaccuracies, but actually where those dorms should be located. In most of my maps, I think currently they are in Ward 6, but I was hoping to get some direction about whether council would prefer them, say, in three different wards, they could be split between Ward 1 and a Ward 8 and a Ward 6, or they just between 1 and 6, or they could all be in Ward 8. Um, but where those blocks, who, like who, which, which ward those blocks belong to make a big difference for the rest of the maps. Are there any, is there any feedback that we could give to Nancy on that? Na uh, Councillor Shannon, please. That's, that's a hard question, <laughs> but I think that um, the, the dorms that are on the, um, the dorms that are on the south side of Main Street, it makes sense that um, they would be in Ward 6, or at least some of them would be in Ward 6, possibly some of them would be in Ward 8, and that maybe the ones over on the central campus would belong to Ward 1. That just made sense to me based on kind of location and trying to connect with the neighborhoods that they're adjacent to. Yeah, and, and my question is specifically around those southern campus blocks, assuming that the other parts of campus would be in a, a Ward 1 or a Ward, like a Ward 1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that they could, um, 
it's probably possible to make a map either dividing some of those between six and eight or keeping them all in six. But yeah, there's trade offs everywhere. So I guess I don't feel that strongly about that. Okay. Thanks. If Thanks. Go ahead. I, uh, the only thing I would add is if, if the entire Southern UVM campus is in Ward 6, that campus population then makes up a, a quite a sizable percent of the Ward 6 population. I think something like 60% of the Ward 6 population would then be that campus. I would say then it makes more sense to divide that. Thanks, Councillor Shannon. Um, just want to cover where we are in terms of uh, next steps. Um, so today is the 23rd of May. You are looking for council feedback and direction on map refinements, uh, which moves us to June 6th. So um, just wanted to put out there to councilors that I was asked by a number of councilors to schedule an opportunity, another opportunity um, either by meeting or some other means on redistricting that would allow community members um, such as the independent mapping group um, to present ideas on alternative maps. And our options would be a public forum solely devoted to redistricting on June 6th at our next meeting for say 30 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. Um, or we could have a meeting on June 13th um, as a public forum on redistricting, call it for say an hour from five until six, devoted only to that topic. Um, and rather than polling everyone sit sitting right here, I'll just be reaching out to each of you to elicit your feedback and what you would like to see, um, or if you or if you feel that we don't need to have either one. Um, but if 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 we do, we need to try to make that decision very soon. Um, and that would sort of conflict, maybe, with your timeline. We have June 6th would be the tentative for revised maps. Um, and uh, is it possible for that to be June 13th instead, if we were to have to, if we were to need additional time? Or um, you've, also had a, you've also had another meeting on the 20th for additional discussion. So are you leaving yourself both of those dates um, and I understand that you're not available on the 27th. Yeah, so um, we had offered those dates, understanding that we could probably bring back some minor refinements to these maps for the June 6th meeting. Um, we could check in on availability for the 13th. So you're thinking a special meeting for that night? Okay. Um, and then because there is already a council meeting on the 20th, we were just kind of holding that as having some availability to come back and either support additional iterations of maps or additional discussion about them. Um, so certainly if you wanted to schedule a dedicated public hearing on the June 6th meeting, we're, we're available for that. Um, and if the council wanted to see some minor tweaks to what is already presented to you for that meeting, that would be achievable to help aid in that discussion. All right. Um, well, we'll, well, I'll hope to be able to give, give that feedback based on what my colleagues are looking to, to do in terms of either the sixth or a special meeting, just really a, not a special council meeting, but just simply a community forum of sorts to give people who may not be able to cover their, their thoughts in two minutes. Um, and there have been people, as you know, that have spent a fair amount of time trying to Work on work on this alongside your efforts, um, uh, but that would be in the next couple of days that we could certainly figure that out um, and be able to move forward with that. Um, and then my understanding is that at the meeting in July, at our one meeting in July, that is when we must make a decision on the map that we are going to move forward on. Is that correct? That is my understanding that that would be the last date that the council could. Um, discuss a map that they want to put forward for the ballot and initiate the public hearing process for the charter change. Okay. One, um, one additional thing I was going to offer. Um, so Nancy had shared this map package. We've been calling it a story map, which is the technical name for the website. 
um, this virtual map package which shows all of the different options that she presented to you tonight, as well as historic ward maps. Um, this is something that if the council, if it was helpful for getting feedback on these different options, we could include some kind of a you know, comment form or something that people as they're looking at these different map options could share feedback on. Um, if that might help in just thinking about how you move forward with next steps. All right, well, well, we'll certainly have our homework cut out for us. We've had a, a first go around. We've had an opportunity to look at the maps. This will give us all a chance to reach out to constituents and um, to get further feedback and then talk amongst ourselves as well um, and hopefully be able to give you lots of, lots of great feedback at, for our next, at the next opportunity. Um, is there, is there anything else that any other counselor would like to offer at this time? Councilor Carpenter? Just, um, we're talking about the wards um, sort of independently of the fact that the versions of them will have 12 counselors, 14 counselors, and 16 counselors. And in terms of governance, quality of governance, our ability to be efficient, get work done, I really think it's important for the, us to keep that in mind too. We need to function well as a council. Um, I personally have a lot of concerns about a 16 member council and our ability to, to offer the best governance that we can. And that doesn't, having more people doesn't necessarily mean you're better represented. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. And, and I'll just add on to Councillor Carpenter's comments. We've heard a lot of us, we have, and I represent districts, have talked about a district as being this anomalous um, sort of ugly feature that we want to remove from our, our current, the way we currently set up districts in the city. And I'll just suggest that, you know, if we get to a point where we're at an impasse, I still think it's a viable construct to get to a consensus on on the number of counselors. So I'll, I'll say that I'm still open to the idea of districts being a mathematical construct to sort of get us to, you know, if 12 counselors is the number and we're at, and we're at eight wards to do that. Because yes, it isn't ideal and it's not as elegant as I would like, but it's less problematic than some of the other decisions we might have to make around redistricting. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Councilor Bergman, did you know? Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Hansen, please go ahead. Great, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to, I wanted to respond to the question about the UVM dorms, which is that I think they should either be, we're talking about, I guess the question was specific to the athletic campus and Redstone campus, um, which are both the two campuses south of Main Street. And I think it should either be you know, all in one ward or, or divided somewhat evenly between the two wards, you know, maybe athletic campuses in um, Ward 8 and Redstones in Ward 6 or something. It doesn't have to be exactly that, but I say that because to, right now we have this really bizarre situation where um, the Redstone Lofts building, half of that building is in Ward 6, and really the rest of Redstone and Athletic Campus are in Ward 8. And so that half of the building essentially, I think, goes pretty, pretty ignored and um, within campaigns and with, you know, people trying to engage voters on, on these issues. So I think it's um, trying to get to more balance and, and not, not just have a tiny slice of, of campus, you know, in one ward. And then to respond to what Councillor Barlow was saying. I, I feel differently, I guess, than Councillor Barlow. I, I do think it should be a priority to um, eliminate the districts and then get to a, a better system. Uh, to me, that is one of the more important things that, that we should be looking to do here. Um, but thank you. Thanks, thanks Councillor Hanson. Councillor Hightower. I'm sorry, I know this is my second comment, but I agree with. <laughs> Councillor Hansen, I think of all of the priorities that I have, I think removing the district versus ward system is pretty high up there. 
Councillor Shannon. <laughs> Just to stick on the same topic, <laughs> I will say that um, I voted no on the district system. I thought it was terrible, and I appreciate all of the problems with it. Um, but at this point, I think people have more or less adjusted to it. And I kind of agree with Councillor Barlow that we have a bunch of difficult decisions. And while it's um, definitely not my favorite way to go, I'm trying to remain open to finding that consensus and, um, uh, and addressing some, to me, the more important issue as a voter is that question of would somebody be eliminated from running just based on where they live? For example, that would be a, a real concern for me. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Shannon. Um, <laughs> Councillor Bergman, please. Uh, I think that if we can solve the ward configurations, then you don't have a problem uh, with the districts because the districts are creatures of the wards. So if we can settle that, then we have settled it. And then it's just a question of whether you can stomach uh, going up to 16 or going to 14. I served on a council with 14. It seems to be no different than what we've got here. And there's enough work to go around for more councilors. I do not think that it's a pro it will be a problem. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Bergman. Uh, well, we'll... We'll leave you with all of these opinions, <laughs> and uh, um, and we'll we as I say, I will be in touch with you after speaking with others about how we go forward in terms of additional public comment and public feedback. Um, with that, we'll close uh, this item. Um, and before going to the other two deliberative items, we'll recess the city council meeting at eight thirty-five and call to order the local control commission meeting um, and give everyone a chance to get to that agenda. The first item on our agenda is, is uh, item number one. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Shannon, seconded by Commissioner Travers. Is there any discussion on the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We have our agenda. The second item on our agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated? Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by Commissioner Travers. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 I, any opposed? Uh, the motion passes. We have um, we have approved our consent agenda. So we have three items that are on our deliberative agenda. The first is item 3.01, a first class liquor license application 2223 um, for Lalagoras uh, Indian Nepali restaurant at 148 Church Street. Commissioner Shannon. Uh, move to approve the 2022-2023 First Class Liquor License Application for Lale Guras Indian Nepali Restaurant with the following conditions contingent upon fire marshal approval. All city permits need to be closed out with all standard conditions. Thank you, Count Thank you Commissioner Shannon. Um, uh, is it seconded by Councilor Tra uh, Commissioner Travers? Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed, please say no. Uh, the motion passes. The second item on our agenda is item 3.02, an outside consumption permit application for Lalagoras Indian Nepali Restaurant at 148 Church Street. Uh, Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2022 outside consumption permit application for Lalagoras Indian Nepali Restaurant with the following condition, Church Street Marketplace approval. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Seconded by Count Commissioner Travers. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. 
Uh, we have approved that motion. The last item on our agenda is item 3.03, .03, um, an outside consumption permit application for the other place. Commissioner Shannon. Move to approve the 2022 outside 2022-2023 outside consumption permit application for the other place for, Winu for North Winooski Ave. Thank you, Commissioner Shannon. Uh, seconded by Commissioner Travers. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. And we have passed that application. With no other business on this agenda and seeing no objection, we'll adjourn the local control commission meeting at uh, 8.40 and return to our council meeting and the next item on our deliberative agenda, which is item 7.02, the Main Street concept approval and design contract amendment. Uh, we, had a we had a presentation on this from at our last meeting um, and we before we go into further discussion, uh, Councillor Hansen, did you want to bring forward a motion? Sure, I'll bring a motion, and it is slightly different, um, slightly different than what's on board docs, but I did circulate it to the full um, council and to Lori Oldberg as well. Um, so I would move that we, let's see, sorry. Um, I would move that we, one, authorize the Director of Public Works to execute contract amendments with Van Vaness Hangen Breslin, Inc., raising the maximum limiting amount by $202,534, with an additional $217,000, 15% in contingency funds for a total up to one point or one million six hundred sixty three thousand six hundred sixty five dollars for anticipated scope adjustments for the design of the Great Streets Main Street project subject to final review and approval from the city attorney's office and two to approve the Great Streets Main Street concept designs with a fully separated bicycle facility from Battery Street to South Union Street and a proposed curb to curb width of 40 feet reducing from an existing varying width of 50 to 70 feet, which will effectuate the conversion of the on-street parking configuration from diagonal to parallel. No, I think, I think going to staff at this point is, is the, would make the most sense. Thank you. Nathan Spencer, Director of Public Works, joined by Senior Public Works Engineer Laura Wheelock and Public Works Engineer Olivia Doris. And we also have City Engineer Norm Baldwin here as well. So we are very excited to follow up on the May 9th meeting that we had with you all. We are not going to rehash that presentation, uh, but we are going to focus on what we've heard from the public and how we are responding to that. Uh, there were sir, some public comments tonight, and uh, I'll turn it over to Senior Engineer Laura Wheelock to go through that. Hello, good night. Um, so here just to kind of go through the, as Chapin mentioned, the, the really high level, um, kind of the focus of a lot of the comments that we've received so far. So early on um, with bringing the project back, we heard a lot of questions about the intersection controls within the corridor. So in response to that, we've commissioned, um, or hopefully we'll commission tonight uh, with the first motion, um, the ability to review the intersections and prepare an evaluation matrix. This will be, um, I'll go into that a little bit more on the next slide um, about what that might include. The next topic would be the on-street parking with the change from the diagonal to the parallel. Um, as well as with adding some of the other amenities and whatnot. So we've asked our consultant for a proposal on a parking study to update our inventory um, and assess the need that we have in our corridor and uh, within a five to 10 minute walk of Main Street, as well as what the availability is of our existing parking capacity and then offer solutions. This could be mitigation of 
the way that we are maybe not using our parking efficiently, better wayfinding to where the parking exists, or um, a finding that could be that we need more parking um, to mitigate the on-street loss in a structured way. The last, um, which was touched on with the amended motion, is the shared use path that was a part of the concept package that was submitted. It is on the south side of Main Street from Winooski to Union. Um, the goal or the, 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 uh, the fundamentals behind having brought that forward is that we asked our consultants to keep all of the amenities in our cross section, but this is the one area of Main Street where there's significant encroachments of uh, buildings and properties. Um, and so their compromise was, was merging the bicycles and pedestrians, um, but we've heard very strongly both uh, at this meeting, our public works, as well as independent outreach, that that's not really a, a great path forward. So um, before we had gotten here tonight, you know, we were gonna look at the dimensions and really play the game of inches. Um, we talked at the Public Works Commission about the potential to relocate the six parking spaces to create new parking, uh, either within the concept plan or on side streets, um, or and use the parking study if necessary, or, or if the findings are such that we don't need the spaces, we could remove them. So just to quickly touch on the intersection evaluation matrix, this will include review of things like the level of service and the operations, the size of uh, the different intersection control types, really high focus on the safety of our users at these intersections, but what does uh, these intersections also do to the rest of the space? How much space can be activated? What are the utility impacts? Um, what are the road grades that go into creating safe intersections as well as, you know, what could be the parking impact from these different sized intersections in our downtown. So those are all key factors that we can bring forward um, as we continue on the design of this project. To speak to parking um, and what the parking study and assessment will really compose of, uh, this is a partnership paired with CEDO and our planning office to, to ensure that what we're doing on Main Street, you know, like everything with Great Streets Main Street, it's a multi-departmental uh, collaboration. So this will also include, you know, looking at different techniques, looking at our zoning, the flex space, the land use, the demand, um, really lots of different things that go into parking. That could take a lot longer than we have tonight. Um, and then the last one is the cross section. So for those who might not be familiar, this is looking up Main Street over on the right hand side. Um, this is really slow to respond, but this is the shared use uh, path that was proposed in your concept packet um, that is on the amendment for the motion tonight. And that's what I've got for you guys. So overall, we are uh, here to answer questions. There are two actions in the motion tonight. Uh, one relates to the general concept design and the council's authority to set line and grade of road. And the second one is related to this contract amendment. We really see this as a generational opportunity to overhaul uh, a very pivotal street that connects our highway to a new train station and everything in between. The water mains under this road are from the 1880s. Uh, that's over 130 years old for some of our most valuable transmissions lines. We want to do this right from the bottom up, and this whole scale re-envisioning of the street similar to St. Paul is an exciting generational effort uh, for us all to contemplate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, So um, if there are counselors who have uh, comments or uh, wish to have qu or have questions of staff, um, now is the time. Um, we're trying to allot about 20 minutes for this, for this discussion. How many counselors are there that wish to speak to this item? Okay, that should make life pretty easy. Um, Councilor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I'm, I'm excited about this project. I think it's uh, going to be um, a great improvement um, to Burlington. But I have heard loud and clear, as it seems you have as well, the concerns of um, businesses around, park, specifically businesses around parking loss. We heard from North Star and we've heard from the ski rack. And I'm encouraged that there is going to be um, process around trying to mitigate that loss, not just with wayfinding, but also taking inventory and everything. And I'm wondering if you could talk more about um, the timing of, of that in relation to the overall project. And so like, would we do this first, hopefully find, find the parking that we need and then proceed with the rest of the project, or would it be other than that? Thanks. Um, 
it would happen starting immediately. Main Street is a, is a fast-paced project, um, but it will still take a while to construct. And so even starting now and not waiting for the rest of the design will still have an impact in its findings. Um, we anticipate taking the inventory and starting the study, you know, hopefully concluding, you know, certainly with, I said within a year, um, our other partner departments wanted it much faster than that. So the hope would be that we'll be hearing about the findings of this, this study much sooner um, than even the completion of the design of the project. And, and so um, would the, uh, the rest of the project be dependent on the findings of the parking study, I guess? No, um, the change in the parking is significant enough, which is why we are in front of you guys tonight, that really it changes the course of the design, um, the decision that's in front of you. Uh, so it's, um, we felt it was really important to ensure we got good public buy-in. We've been um, to, a lot, to a lot of different places uh, since this project started, but certainly again since the end of April, looking for uh, feedback and to provide back information to people about where the project is going. Um, so, you know, I, I understand the concern, and I think the, the Church Street Marketplace probably uh, commission stated it the best. Everybody that was at the commission meeting this month loved the idea of what would happen on Main Street. They struggled greatly with the parking loss. They understand that Main Street should not be a parking lot in our city, but there still is a parking need that needs to be mitigated. Um, I felt that echoed really true with where I thought Main Street was at, but you know, I still do understand that the parking is a great concern. If I could uh, add on to that engagement moving forward, we heard tonight from businesses they wanted to be engaged. And while we've had three dozen meetings to date, while we've had online surveys, while we've gone door to door with the consultants, there's a desire for more. I spent time today going door to door to uh, two key businesses that we heard from tonight, and I will make it a commitment to continue to do that with our team because what we're hearing is that people are excited but nervous that this needs to be done well. And so we need to make a direct line of communication with our awesome local businesses, and we will make that commitment. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Councillor Berkman. Well, I want to thank you for listening to folks. You've heard a lot from people over the last uh, couple of weeks. I know that we have as well, and I just want to appreciate the, that incorporation uh, that we see in the revised language, um, particularly with the, um, the shared use or the, the, the moving away from the shared use on the one block, which I think will make uh, kids coming down from Edmonds a whole lot easier. That's the side of the street that they're gonna march on down in large groups. Um, I am also appreciative of the roundabout uh, openness that you've got that's really critically important. And um, I want to say that the lessons that we continue to learn from the North Winooski Avenue um, corridor um, process is, uh, is applicable here. So the, uh, the TDM work that uh, we're starting to do on North Winooski Avenue, and that we'll talk about at the Tuk uh, some tomorrow, um, is something that we can't forget. This is, as you said, transformational. And so uh, the idea that um, transportation is just limited to tourists or to customers is, you know, is actually quite silly. So I really look forward, I'm looking over to Megan, at the TDM study that is in the budget. And that, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, the folks at DPW sort of can't be left hanging with the, you know, the whole thing on their shoulders. They need the support uh, to do that. I've heard from them loud and clear that that's the case. But together, we should be able to make a, make a go of it and make some real changes so that Main Street is not a parking lot because we deserve significantly better than that. So thank you, and I hope we all will support this, uh, uh, this uh, motion. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Bergman. I see Councillor Hansen has his hand up. Please go ahead. 
Great, thanks. I really agree with Councillor Bergman. Just want to thank the project team. This has been a ton of work, a ton of engagement, um, and it's a really exciting, huge, and hugely impactful project. And of course, you know, anything we do this this big and significant, there's definitely going to be pushback and opposition, and there's definitely going to be concerns. Um, and I think we need to do our best to to address the concerns. I, I trust this team to really do that and work on that. And the big picture is that we're making a really important step forward for safety, um, mobility, stormwater, addressing the climate crisis, um, equity, you know, allowing people to get around our city by different modes and, and especially low cost transportation modes that we're making easier and safer. Um, so I think this, it hits on a lot of our priorities as a city and it's right on our one of our most prominent streets um, downtown. So I'm really excited. I'm really proud of all the work we're doing and the fact that I believe, you know, that we're gonna continue to move forward on this and really appreciate a lot of the feedback that we've heard recently around ensuring that, you know, pedestrians and, and people on bikes aren't, and, and people in wheelchairs aren't all being, you know, merged into the same space um, in that one section and excited to hear that we can avoid that and, and keep these facilities separate throughout the project because I would much rather, with something this big, let's, let's do it right from the start. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone and excited to support this. Thanks, Councillor Hansen. Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Um, thank you for all of your work to make this project possible. I think it's something that's very much looked forward to in the community and, you know, including our business community. But I, I do have concerns about the parking, and I have kind of a specific question. Um, I, I think that it's right to say that as we develop this street into a very beautiful place, that people don't mind walking because they're walking... Um, they're, they're planning on doing some walking, right? If they're going to the cafes and things like that on Church Street. But I also think that what we heard tonight is from a very different kind of business. And there are certain kinds of businesses that need that um, direct parking access. And we've lost them on Church Street, like a hardware store. Um, and... So North Star has that type of business and I don't think has access to off-street parking. That block though, I'm wondering how many park how many parking spaces what is the net loss or gain of parking spaces there because I also know there's an outrageously large driveway apron there currently for what used to be a bus station. And I haven't looked carefully enough at that piece to know how that's being treated in the new plan. Um, is the driveway apron there closing and gaining some um, parallel parking spaces? Yeah, um, as we redevelop the street, and, and actually we do with a lot of our projects, we do um, bring driveways into our driveway standard compliance. Um, so with Great Streets, we'd bring that driveway curb cut, as well as a few others along the corridor into what our standard is. And so it does optimize the amount of parking that we can get in a parallel capacity. Um, the net loss is still you know, for that block fairly significant because there's diagonal on both sides. And so you're losing that um, number of spaces on both sides of the street. And so it, it's a it's a loss comparable to the church to Winooski block, uh, but not as significant as some of the others. So it's, it's always hard to, to measure against them because there's different parking configurations along each of them in the corridor. Is there a number? Do you know? Sorry, I hate to ask you will, for things like I, a number off will, I, with that, without warning in advance. Yeah, no, um, we do have a number. I'd have to look it up in our files, though, so I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Shannon. Um, I believe the next, next person in the queue is Councillor House. Thank you so much for needing to speak again this evening so that I can ask you to please go ahead. <laughs> thank you so much, President Paul. Um, yeah, I just want to um, thank thank you all for putting this together. It really sounds like you 
um, have, have done a lot to, um, you know, engage with people in our community, hear from them, um, and see um, what, they, what they are wanting in this project. Um, and yeah, I definitely, I trust that um, DPW will do its, its due diligence um, in, in the parking study. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate you all um, building that in there. Um, and, you know, just especially because there are buildings um, like City Hall and the Superior Court that are just, you know, they're, they're critical to civic engagement. Um, and I, I do, uh, you know, I, I do have concerns about the parking because I think we need to, I think we need to figure out how to support people in this city for whom it's um, essential to have a car. But, um, I, you know, I think that we also, um, we, we need to figure out um, for people who it's not a necessity, um, how to provide, you know, reasonable and, and reliable and sustainable alternatives. And I think um, having separate bike and walk spaces is great. Um, yeah, so, so thank you all for, um, for, for putting this together. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor House. Um, seeing no others in the queue. Oh, uh, Councillor Jang. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll be short. I mean, I think it's just, I don't want people to be expecting that this parking management plan will become a crystal goal and change the world. Let's, let's be very realistic very here, right? I think we have done it with uh, the North Vinitsky Corridor and we all know what was the outcome. So I just want people to understand that, that, that particular aspect. And was just also wondering for the businesses, are there opportunities for, let's say, temporary parking, at least for people who can drop things and then continue to move on? Is that something that you will be studying as well? Yes, thanks for bringing that up. Um, the organization of the re and the regulation of the on-street space is certainly something that's being looked at. Um, you know, we've we've talked with JP a few times through the engagement uh, that we've had with him earlier on the project about you know he doesn't have to wait for Main Street to be constructed to to look for those types of changes that could really help their businesses now. You know, if there's and and we've done the same with the Flynn. You know, it, they've asked for ADA spaces. We've already started that conversation. Um, Chapin talked to me today, you know, maybe we just need to go visit with JP and, and ask him about that kind of a pick up and drop off space, you know, in at his business and, and find a way to make that work. And I think that's going to be one of our follow ups because he's repeated it to many people a, a couple of times, you know, that necessity that's not there today. Um, and we'd like it to be there today and we'd like it to be there at the end of the Main Street project as well. I mean, I think that's, that's great. So we have to be very clear from the beginning. Any backlashes in the future. But also wanted to say, Jack Henson, Councillor Henson, thank you so much for what you just said. It just spoke to me very well. And I'm looking forward for that T where Church Street and Main Street will allow people to just walk, bike, and make it beautiful with us cars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Chang. Are there any other councillors that wish to speak to this item? Seeing none, we can go to a vote. Um, oh, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. <clears throat> um, appreciate uh, the chance to just share a couple of remarks before this uh, significant vote. Um, this project, the Great Streets Main Street project has really been a very significant priority of this administration since approximately 2014 uh, for the reason that it will do so much to improve our downtown. It will improve the tree canopy, improve active transportation, both biking and walking with all the, the climate and health impacts, uh, benefits that flow from that. It will, um, uh, it will improve our ability to protect, protect Lake Champlain, do so in um, a manner that has both uh, environmental benefits and landscaping benefits that will contribute to Main Street just being elevated as a public place to be quite dramatically. Ultimately, I'm convinced that this will be a transformation comparable uh, to the transformation that the city achieved 40 years ago with the uh, elimination of, with, with the change in, in Church Street and the move towards a pedestrian marketplace. And um, it is amazing that we have, uh, through um, really years of planning that go back, 
um, uh, all the way to the last administration uh, be in position to uh, pay for this transformative investment using the tax increment financing economic development program. Um, I want to be clear that I absolutely support both of the um, uh, material changes that uh, seem to be coming out tonight, both a uh, commitment um, for, t for further study of our options for mitigating the parking loss, and uh, importantly, um, I fully support the separation of the, the bike and the p pedestrian uses on the easternmost block, um, as uh, I believe this motion does. It's exciting to be on the, the cusp of this consequential action, and I want to really um, voice my appreciation to the counselors who are on the two committee and other counselors who are, are partnering with the administration to um, uh, build on the good work of the team that has, has put us in position for action tonight and to keep um, this uh, major project moving. It would be easy for a project of this scale and complexity to get bogged down and delayed and, and to push uh, the, the construction uh, period out um, beyond uh, next summer. And I think the council seemingly be on the cusp of, of taking strong action um, is, is really one of a uh, consequential step towards um, keeping us on track and actually getting this project into construction next year. So I want to thank the councilors for that. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Um, Seeing no others, uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion made by Councillor Hansen and seconded by Councillor Bergman regarding the Main Street concept approval and design contract amendment, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very, very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. The last item on our deliberative agenda is 7.03, which is an updated resolution now entitled Enforcement of Short-Term Lodging Permit Requirements. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, I move to waive the reading and adopt the resolution Enforcement of Short-Term Rental Permits that is marked final updated. I'd ask for the floor back after a second. Okay. Motion and I has, second. Motion has been made uh, by Councillor Shannon and seconded by Councillor Bergman. Councillor Shannon, you have the floor. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I brought this forward because I had been hearing um, some things from members of the public and there seemed to be some confusion about the enforcement of, um, of our existing ordinance as it applies to short-term lodging. And um, when checking with, uh, wh what I had heard was that we were not enforcing our existing regulations, but Director Ward has confirmed that we are in fact enforcing our existing regulations. Um, I think the confusion comes in part because there was a period of time when we were not enforcing our existing res regulations, and I think it's um, important to make that clear. There even has been some communications between counselors and staff members that is less than less than clear. So this this resolution does two things. It it confirms that we do have an intention to um, enforce our existing regulations as they apply to all lodging units, as well as ask that um, we, we aren't doing um, a really hard enforcement on, uh, on people who have been running short-term um, short rentals we have recognized that people have bookings on file, that those folks who have booked um, lodging through uh, online platforms like Airbnb, um, 
they could be very victimized, honestly, if we had a, a very hard enforcement policy. And I don't think that we want to ruin anybody's wedding after they've planned it for a year. And so for that reason, this also clarifies um, that we, we will be allowing for, um, uh, for agreements to happen um, that allows people to honor those bookings as late as December 31st, but that is the latest. And it's not the intention that everybody necessarily gets to December 31st. If you don't demonstrate that um, you have bookings now um, that run that late, there would be no reason to, um, to work out an agreement that, that then allowed you to continue to advertise. So I want to be clear that that's not the intention with this resolution. Um, so thank you and that's all. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we've, we've tried to allot about 20 minutes for this item as well. Uh, Councillor Berkman, please go ahead. Um, and are there other, Councillor, and to be followed by Tra Councillor Travers. I, I spent uh, 20 years in forcing ordinances for this city, and um, it was always my perspective that if we had a policy on the books, that we took it seriously, and until it was either deemed unconstitutional or we changed it, that it was important. And that was particularly true of uh, health and safety. Um, I spent a lot of time in the enforcement of, of housing codes, and Director Ward uh, succeeded me in, in, in that job. We are in a wicked, wicked, wicked crisis. It's, it's, it's probably beyond crisis in terms of the loss of housing. Uh, my wife's the ward clerk for uh, Ward 2, just lost another inspection, uh, uh, an election official because they got priced out of their housing. We have to do everything possible to stem the tide. What this does is it says we'll use whatever we have at our disposal to enforce the law. Nothing in this says that if we come up with a better solution, and you're working on one ostensibly, uh, that that won't uh, be able to, uh, to replace the zoning ordinance and then we get a chance to, uh, to move on to that brave new world. But right now, we have got a, uh, a zoning ordinance that defines hotels and inns and motels. It, it defines bread and breakfasts. I've heard a critique that says that it's vague. It's my, my opinion uh, that it is not vague and that we should Take it on. The facts always will determine what um, something is or is not. But those regulations, those definitions in there have been on the books for a long time. The industry changes over time. And so language such as the customary uses um, change as times change. And we get a chance to update that because otherwise y'all would be changing an ordinance like every month, every year, every two years. It's ridiculous. So we get a chance to, to do that um, with our ordinances um, as long as what we do is reasonable. And it is absolutely reasonable in my mind that we enforce the current zoning ordinance um, related to hotels and inns and other lodgings. Um, to the extent we can. I understand the last point I just want to make is enforcement is not a quick fix. It is not an immediate fix. And the judicial system is frustrating in that. But you know what? We live in America, and due process is really important. And so I'm willing to put my, um, my heart and my soul into doing the right thing. Part of that is accepting the due process, and the other part of it is using the resources that we've got to, uh, to enforce the law. And that's all that we are asking for this, and it would be a shame 
if we basically said that the existing rules that we have that are governing do not count and you all don't have to, um, to abide by them out there in, in the public and the hemorrhaging of uh, housing will uh, continue unabated and, and accelerate. Thank you, I hope we all will uh, support this. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. Councillor Travers to be followed by Councillor Hansen. Thank you, President Paul. I appreciate the effort that uh, Councillor Shannon and Bergman have put into this. Um, my preference would actually be that uh, the council either refer this matter to the Ordinance Committee or table it for two weeks. Uh, speaking as the chair of the Ordinance Committee, I can tell you that uh, we were sent uh, uh, enforcement framework uh, to consider for short-term rentals a, a few weeks ago with a directive from this council to act expeditiously to uh, bring it back to this group on or by June 1st. Uh, certainly, I'm just one of three members on that committee, but uh, can say that uh, my hope is that uh, we will have a proposed uh, and new enforcement framework for uh, this council to consider in two weeks. Uh, so therefore, my, my preference would have been that uh, we not be discussing this matter tonight, but rather in the context of that larger discussion in, in two weeks. Uh, yet, yet we are discussing this now. Um, I wholly agree that there is a housing crisis in Burlington at the moment and that we need to be doing everything we can to, uh, to expand the number of housing units available to folks and appreciate the mayor's efforts and colleagues on the council's efforts to be reviewing that and I'm excited for uh, zoning changes to come uh, to perhaps uh, open up opportunities for more housing. Uh, I also agree that we need to be uh, better enforcing and regulating short-term rentals. I think the advent of, of Airbnb and, and VRBO is, is something new that's not entirely contemplated uh, by our existing ordinances, and uh, I agree we need to be acting expeditiously, and I'm excited by the work that the Ordinance Committee is doing on this. I also think that there is general consensus among councillors that there are certain short-term rentals that are simply going to be left out of any enforcement mechanism, will not be allowed as a short-term rental. We heard from public comment, for example, about uh, a, a single family residence uh, being used as a short-term rental when it's not the primary residence of the owner. Uh, I, I haven't seen any version of short-term rental regulations that would allow for something like that. Um, it's not something that, that, as far as I can speak to, the Ordinance Committee is considering uh, I know the versions that the uh, previous council passed as well did not consider that either. And so certainly with respect to uh, uh, that building, uh, I'm glad and I understand that um, uh, Department of Permitting and Inspections and, and Mr. Ward's office uh, have been um, enforcing against units like that. And, and to that I say, uh, go forth. Um, my concern is that there's debate and there's different interpretations beyond that as to how different short-term rentals are enforced. Uh, and, and honestly, I, I am somewhat concerned that by going ahead and enforcing the existing regulations and, or, and, and zoning ordinances we have in place, that, that it may be counterproductive and that we may lose long-term housing units to the bed and breakfast permitting process that uh, would be better regulated by whatever framework this council comes up with in a couple weeks. So uh, we heard from uh, Director Tuttle a few weeks ago with respect to um, pending and, and permitted uh, bed and breakfast, capital B bed and breakfast in the city. And 15% you know, of them were for partial short-term rentals within uh, housing units. I think there was general consensus in the council that you would be allowed to rent out rooms in your own house. 20% uh, are for short-term rentals uh, of an owner's own residence, and I think there's been general consensus among councillors that folks should be able to rent out their own residence, but that's only 35% of bed and breakfast permits. 4% uh, were for seasonal waterfront homes, 20% uh, involved properties with an accessory dwelling unit, 24% uh, involve short-term rent rentals in a duplex property, another 13% are for short-term rentals within a three or four unit building, and, and I don't know that there's consensus among this council that enforcement means that those types of units would not be allowed. And so my suggestion would be, yes, we need to enforce. Yes, I'm hopeful that in two weeks uh, we'll be in a better place to understand what that enforcement is going to look like. But let's, let's not give this directive quite yet. I think there's general understanding as to those 
truly problematic short-term rentals, and I would say go ahead. Uh, but, but maybe uh, let's, let's hit pause a moment and uh, allow a couple weeks until we can have this discussion in greater context. Uh, I will just also add one other item, um, which is that I, I appreciate the effort to um, honor uh, existing bookings through December 30th for those short-term rentals that are not in compliance. Uh, I don't want to ruin anyone's wedding either. Uh, um, but I also know there are plenty of short-term rentals uh, within uh, Burlington that are on Airbnb and VRBO right now that you know, effectively have been permitted to exist for, for some time now, or at least uh, I understand the offices that are very busy with enforcing many matters across the city, perhaps have not completely caught up with every short-term rental. Uh, a number of short-term rentals have bookings beyond December 30th, and so I think there's an honest discussion to be had of, of are, are there legal ramifications for us tonight taking action to say to those short-term rentals, uh, need, need to cancel their bookings uh, into uh, 2023. I think that a part of the discussion a couple weeks from now is going to have to be for those short-term rentals that are not permitted by what, whatever enforcement mechanism we come up with, uh, what are we going to do for those places that are able to demonstrate that right now they have bookings uh, in, into next year. It's, already, it's hard to believe, but it's already May 23rd. We're almost halfway through uh, 2022, so it's, it's not unreasonable to understand that folks have started to be booking into early 23 and perhaps even into next spring and summer. Um, so I, again, my preference would be uh, that uh, uh, we either refer this to the Ordinance Committee or if there's enough support for it, I would move to table it a couple weeks. Uh, I won't make that motion quite yet, um, but certainly would be open to doing that so we can have a broader discussion of this, again, hopefully at our meeting on June 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Travers. We have Councillor Hansen and then Councillor Hightower. Great, thanks, and I'd love to hear if the co-sponsors um, or you know anyone from staff or others have responses to what Councillor Traverse has raised. Um, but in general, I am supportive of this. I think another concern or question I would wanna raise is around this December 31st aspect. And our, I, I, I just wanna make sure we're not undermining the intention of, the, uh, of this resolution and want to make sure there's some mechanism for understanding that, you know, it's, it's bookings that have been made up to this point. And yeah, I don't want to create a scenario where um, people can actually, after seeing this, you know, can fit in many new bookings that would happen before de December 31st. So that's the only, I know that that's the intention, but I just want to understand um, if we think that that will be the outcome and, and maybe why. Um, so thanks and yeah, definitely supportive of this and look forward to hearing more information based on um, what I've asked and, and Councillor Traverse, thanks. Uh, Councillor Hanson, were you looking for a response from the, um, from the, from on the resolution from, uh, from Councillor Shannon or it just as a observation? I would, yeah, I would be, it would be helpful to hear a response either from one of the co-sponsors or if we have anyone from city staff that is able to speak to that, that would also be, either one would be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Shannon, do you want to answer, try to answer that? Uh, sure, I'm not sure exactly the specifics that Councilor Hansen is concerned about, um, but I will say that it, our existing ordinance, if something is being um, permitted as a bed and breakfast, it does require owner occupancy. Um, if it's not owner occupied, it fits into the hotel definition, which would be allowed downtown, but it is not allowed in the residential areas. Um, as far as, so could some things be permitted that some future ordinance wouldn't allow, that's possible, um, but we don't really know at this point. And I think it's kind of bad policy when we're, change, when we're making changes to ordinances, which we do, that's like our job. Um, we do that all the time. We don't abandon the existing rules as we change them. We continue to, to live by those rules until we adopt something else. 
in every case, really. So um, this process, even though the ordinance committee um, may be able to bring something to us in two weeks, changing zoning ordinance requires going to the planning commission and public hearings, and it's a very lengthy process, and I don't see how that is avoidable. Um, you raised one other question about the, um, does this language allow people to go to December 31st, which I agree is not the desired result, um, and uh, Attorney Sturdivant, who worked on this, is not here, but I don't know if maybe Director Ward feels comfortable addressing that, if she, she that actually, would be, or is she here? Oh, yeah, she I is. think that that's probably um, the best thing, or let me just, it, uh, we could also hear from Director Ward. Okay, we do, we do have um, uh, Assistant City Attorney Sturdivant if you wanted to ask that question. I, I would right just on. say um, that we did add language. Um, one of the things that we changed is that we clarified that the December 31st date is at the latest and at the latest is added language to help clarify that. But um, I'd also like to hear from Attorney Sturdivant and Director Ward to make sure that they're feeling that that's adequate. Go ahead. Um, Good evening. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Um, am I, just to make sure I'm recognized or <laughs> all set? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I did look at the language and initially had some concerns. There is added language uh, regarding at the latest and to the extent practical. Um, so I do believe those add in an allowance to try to make sure that, um, you know, that, that uh, the code office, when looking to these agreements, can look to have the, the best time frame possible um, to restrict them as, as feasible without uh, making them reduce their, their uh, bookings that are already booked. Great. Director Ward, do you have anything to add? I would just add that uh, our office has been working with um, host compliance through Granic Granicus, the companies have merged, to, uh, for at least a year now, trying to come up with a contractual agreement about how we would work with them so that we could get the information that they have but we don't have the ordinance that specifically says it's gonna be a specific set of 100 likely uh, participants that would be permitted or 400. Those are numbers that would be helpful for me to have um, so that I could then budget with, with Catherine's office to confirm this is what we'd likely get through the budget process through the permit revenue and then we could have the expenditure for the relevant uh, budget permit, uh, the budget, um, I would have put that in the 2023 budget that you just heard uh, a week ago, but it, we don't have that yet because we don't have the an adopted council resolution quite yet, or ordinance. But Scott, Gustin, and I are meeting next Tuesday with the hope that we'll come up with an interim contract with them that will be minimal to get us to that point but we've been working on that with them to try to get that information so we can more aggressively um, locate the properties that are not in our direct purview now. Some of them are not clear from the exact location. They don't have a specific address. There's some photos that require some sleuthing that goes with that. We have to also balance our enforcement with all of the other things that we have to do with zoning enforcement. And when I quickly looked at it, things like uh, parking on lawns and um, you know expansion of yard parking is one of the biggest uh, issues that we get from residents. That's one of their highest concerns. We also have um, un unpermitted work and more than foreign related enforcement. So balancing all those things is a challenge. But while this has been going on, the policy has been 
debated with city council, we have been working on 18 different cases where we've done enforcement. And I think as that policy has gotten more closely developed, we've seen as uh, Councilor Travers just mentioned, we can pretty clearly move forward with those properties where there's not an owner occupancy. We have several on the, the queue now. And in fact, to, today during our enforcement meeting, two new zoning violations were moved forward. There's a quick process. I'll just say that we issue a zoning warning letter first, and then we wait to see if the property owner responds to that warning letter because most people don't understand zoning. We give them time to understand that they're in violation of the comprehensive development ordinance, ask us questions, and give us their response, whether they agree that that's what they're doing or maybe they're doing something else. In some of those cases, we've learned that people are renting for more than 30 days. They advertise as a short-term rental, but under the definition, they actually don't meet that. And so we can register them as a, a regular rental. Um, it is a little complicated process, but I just wanted to be clear that we are already enforcing and we look forward to clarity from council so that we can sharpen our pencils, so to speak. Great, thanks, Director Ward. Um, I think where we had left off was um, just those were in response to Councillor Hansen. Did, Councillor Hansen, did you have anything else that you, or were you were you all set? Um, no, I, I was, if I could follow up sure. for a second on this. Um, sure. I, I guess I'm just, yeah, I'm a little confused because the lang and I'm sorry I didn't flag this ahead of the meeting, but what I'm concerned about is the language says that we would continue to op, you know, they would be allowed to continue to honor bookings. I think it says beyond December 31, 22 at the latest. So that's also a little weird, the word beyond, but it, it, I think the intention is pre-existing bookings, not just all bookings. Otherwise we, I think are undermining ourselves and actually sort of permitting um, that, so. I see Director Ward may be ready to respond. Thanks, D D Director Ward. I, I will say, I was trying to be brief. One of the things that I <laughs> missed sharing was that as part of the warning notice that goes out, when if, if a property owner responds to us that, yes, they are doing it, what do I need to do to come into compliance? One of the things is uh, they can stop <laughs> and we won't further enforce. They can get a permit. If they are still renting, they can say to us, oh, we've got bookings for UVM graduation and for leaf peeping. We've got six more already on the books. What do we do now? The first message is stop, don't do any more, and we'll consult with the city attorney's office who will write an agreement that moves that forward. So I think what Councilor Hansen may be referring to is bookings made by a certain date rather than at ending at a certain date. That's our practice already, but if someone says, I didn't realize we were violating the ordinance direct award, what do we need to do to come into compliance? The first message is uh, either getting a permit or stop any new bookings and we can track those. We can track them better with the agreement we'll have with host compliance, um, but that would be stopping it as soon as we're aware of those bookings. And if the council's recommendation is to stop them by a date certain, that's welcome. That was the only thing I was gonna offer in addition is just that if the council did desire to move forward with this kind of language, recognizing that there would be some honoring of existing bookings, that it might be helpful to include bookings made by a certain date in the past, um, just to address that concern. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I think that we, I don't, I mean, would it be a problem to say to honor pre-existing bookings or should we use like today's date or something? Um, if you all could respond again, because you said by it, by a certain date, would that be today's date if this were to pass? Or? In our case, it's when we learn of the uh, bookings. So if we sent a notice <laughs> to someone and they respond, it's the day that we're doing that. So I think it's the council's prerogative about what date they put on when the bookings are made by. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned with how it's written now where it, it feels like people could continue to make new bookings at this point um, based on how it's written now. 
count, uh, Director Ward? I would say that uh, the city count, city attorney Sturdivant does an excellent job working with us so that when we do have someone who doesn't comply with those instructions, that they've continued to make bookings beyond our notice, that that is what helps us to enforce at environmental court that they've not followed the instructions that were provided by the office. Um, I, so I don't have further guidance about the specific language of the specific date. I think we can work with what's in there because we're gonna stop them regardless. Councilor Hansen. Okay, I'll, I'll hold off on an amendment for now, but I think we should be thinking about that um, as we debate this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Hightower. Um, yeah, I agree with Councillor Traverse that I would rather see this tabled. Not like this has been very confusing to me, and I've been working on this issue for the last more than two years, ever since I joined the council. And I'm I'm reading this. I'm still not 100% sure what it does, despite the discussion. And I'm also frustrated. I'm still frustrated because I think we're now still channeling folks to bed and breakfasts and putting into code and tying to the house what we were hoping to avoid in the first place, which seems so backwards to me. Um, but I'm also still not sure what this does that in terms of the intent that we had, which I think from my understanding is all of us collectively were okay with in unit bed and breakfasts, and I'm not sure what this does. I think this suggests that you can't have those bookings anymore, and if our intent is to allow it later to say, well, you can't book anything now, but maybe in like four months we'll have something where you can start the bookings again. It's a, it's a very strange and confusing regulatory system. Um, and so, and I'm sorry, Director Ward, but I think I might just ask you again, because I still don't understand, like, if we pass this tonight, how how will it change what you're planning on doing versus what how would it change what you're planning on doing? I'm not sure that it'll change what we're doing already. Um, I, th I think what will have a greater impact is the agreement we'll have from uh, host compliance to give us specific information that we can move forward with and then uh, council action that gives direction to community members about the, what the specific regulations going forward will be. And sorry, but you're planning on doing the contract with host compliance anyway? Correct. Okay. We, we were going to do a limited agreement so that we can get to that point to get some additional, some initial information because we're not quite there to be able to determine if there are going to be 100 properties that might comply or 400 depending on how um, wide the net the city council casts. Great, and to Councillor Traverse points, this, what we're about to pass, makes no discrimination between short-term rentals that are in unit, short-term rentals that are in building, short-term rentals that are investment properties. We're just saying you can't have them after a certain date. Is that? Sorry, and you don't have to answer that if you don't. I don't think that this is ready. I can't tell what this does. I think it's confusing. I think it's vague. I don't think it is, the staff is telling us it's not changing what they're gonna do. I think we are about to talk about this in ordinance. Let's figure out if we can get to some agreement. If we can, I don't wanna nix this because I don't want us to not be able to bring it up again because of some rules. So I would rather table it, see if we've gotten somewhere better in two weeks and give something that is a little bit more direction to folks than, than this. Um, so unless somebody has my answer to the question of how discriminatory this is across different types of short-term rentals, I, that's, that's all. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Um, Councillor Councilor Jang to be followed by Councillor Berkman and then Councillor Carpenter. Thank you, President Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Bill, for being here, and you. Thank you so much. Um, I just completely agree with what both uh, Councillor Travers, Taverns, and uh, Hightower talked about. And uh, basically, I believe that we need to table this because this is not clear. I mean, um, 
And at the same time, I would rather work on winning the war than these small battles, you know? And I feel like in two weeks, maybe a policy will be coming in forward right here to us. I think it will be better. But let me ask you, would you, would you make that recommendation for the council to maybe hold on to this until you figure, uh, <clears throat> until they're working on ordinance to come forward? Is it okay, President? Yes, Paul? yes, go ahead. Um, I'd, I'm, what I'm saying is I feel like we can take on what is asked here without a council resolution. I think that what it probably does is if the council was unanimous to say, this is a high priority, Director Ward, we think we want you to put any and all resources into this, it might help balance when I work with the city attorney to say, it needs to be a higher priority than some of the other things that we do, for example, whether it's housing inspections or weatherization work or more than foreign related enforcement. That's the type of direction the council would be giving from the way I understand it. It's, it says any and all resources, so we, it's a way of setting a priority for us. I, I'm hoping and I expect that the direction that we'll get, the information we'll get from the Granicus, Granicus Agreement will provide us the necessary information to do this more aggressive enforcement without that. But again, we will need some final say from city council on what the direction is going forward. If that's gonna change from t the way it is today, that would be extremely helpful to make sure that we have a clear direction to give to residents. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Um, so I'll support definitely the, <clears throat> uh, any, motion to table this resolution. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor Chang. <laughs> Councillor Bergman. So I think that <clears throat> this does give um, new guidance because it talks about proactive enforcement as opposed to a complaint or reactive enforcement. Um, I do not read it and my intent in being a co-sponsor is <clears throat> not to elevate this over other things that would seem to be more important because each time you're engaged with resources, you've got to do that, whether it's a yard parking, you know, if you have two yard parking ones or you can do yard parking versus the four unrelated. And so you're, you're always making those. And so this is just, I think, a um, clarity regarding that. Uh, this is focused on unpermitted uses under our current ordinance. So a bread and breakfast is defined in the ordinance. And if we find that there is a, um, something, a short-term rental that is um, operating, you know, we going to look and say, well, does it have a permit? Oh, it doesn't have a permit. Then we're going to say, uh, okay, is it a bed and breakfast? Oh, let's look at the definition. Now, I have it up on another screen. I can come and get it. I could read it to you, but I don't think that that would serve us uh, well at this late hour. But then if it doesn't uh, uh, meet that definition, well, perhaps it is then a hotel in or motel. Does it meet that, re uh, meet that? And there are clear places in this city where those are permitted and where they are not permitted and when they're a conditional use. And oh, then we go back and so is there a permit for it? Either there is or there isn't. If there isn't, well, then Bill gets to send the letter that says, guess what? I don't think that's vague. I don't think that's unclear. And I think that sends a message to the people of this community that we got rules, particularly around housing, that we expect you all to follow. And this is particularly important because of the housing crisis. And actually, I think that tabling it sends the message that it's actually a low priority. I don't like that as a, as a, uh, a statement of policy around uh, this important um, matter. And I would uh, not support tabling it, and I would hope that we would agree that the ordinances that we have, uh, particularly around housing, should be enforced. Thanks, Councillor Bergman. Councillor Carpenter to be followed by Councillor Hightower and then Councillor Shannon. Thanks. Um, I agree with Councillor Hightower. I find this resolution very confusing. This council made a commitment to send 
the short-term rental ordinance back to ordinance and come up with something in early June. I understand from Councilor Traverse that that is in queue to happen. And I think this is part and parcel of it. We should wait until they come up with whatever recommendation they're going to come up with and we can be clear, particularly um, for the um, permitting and inspection office around what we're talking. And I guess I would disagree having read, trying to read the codes. There is some lack of clarity. I mean, a hotel is defined as three or more rooms. Well, what if you only have one or two? It's silent related to that. A bed and breakfast, you're supposed to serve a meal. Well, what if you're not serving a meal? I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of little things that we need to get our hands around. And in particular, I think pushing people to permit as a hotel or a bed and breakfast is not the way we want to go. We're trying to um, adapt to a change in the industry um, that people want to use their own personal property for. We're not encouraging the development of small boutique hotels in downtown Burlington. That we probably want to discourage that. Um, and I think we, we just should give ourselves a couple of weeks um, to get through that process. Um, I understand that Councilor Bergman and Councilor Shannon d don't support the proposal on the table, but that is what the Ordinance Committee is considering, and I think we need to give them the time to consider it and, and quickly um, so that we can get the rules of the game out there and not push people into boxes that we don't want them to be in in the first place. Thanks, Councilor Carpenter. Councilor Hightower. Um, I think Councillor Carpenter actually just said it. I feel like best case scenario, this ordinance, <laughs> or sorry, not this ordinance, this resolution will just put enforcement on more things that are then going to be pushed into more boxes that are then going to be permanent that we didn't want, or at least I personally didn't want in the first place. Um, and so I think it is unfortunate that we are in this place. I wish that um, the previous council would have come to something and the mayor hadn't vetoed, um, but here we are. And I feel like just saying, we're gonna move forward with the current regime that we think doesn't work and makes permanent this, not permanent permanent, but like incentivizes the, the status quo, I don't think is a, I don't think it's a good policy um, decision. And so um, I will go ahead and move to table. I move to table too. Okay, so Councillor Hightower, what, you're, what you want to do is lay aside the resolution, um, not for a specific date, but just for another time. Um, if we want to take this up again in a month, I will just table it. No, I'll just table it for no time certain. <laughs> okay, all right. So my understanding, and this is why we have a parliamentarian here, is um, that a second is needed for that, and that is a majority vote. Is the a motion to table debatable? It is not debatable. So we need a second to that motion, seconded by Councillor Carpenter. It is not debatable, so we're going to go to a vote. Um, it might be best, uh, CAO Shad, if we could call a roll, since we do have three people who are on Zoom. Of course. Councillor Barlow. Yes. Councillor Bergman. No. Councillor Carpenter. Yes. Councillor Jang. Yes. Councillor Freeman. Hi, sorry. Um, but this is the motion to table, correct? Correct. Yes. Oh no, sorry. And I, um, my signal cut out. I apologize. Thank you. And um, that was a no, Councillor Freeman. No to table. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Yes. Councillor Hightower. Yes. Councillor House. No. Councillor McGee. Yes. Councillor Shannon. No. Councillor Travers. Yes. City Council President Paul. Yes. Eight ayes, four nays. So the motion to table um, is successful uh, and we will move on to our next item. That will complete our deliberative agenda. Uh, we have four remaining items on our agenda. The first is Committee reports. Um, is there a counselor that has a committee report? 
Councillor McGee, and to be followed by Councillor Shan, um, Councillor Hansen, and then Councillor Bergman. Go Thank ahead, you. Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. I just wanted to say that the Public Safety Committee will not be meeting this week. Uh, we're going to wait uh, a couple weeks until we're able to uh, continue work on um, the final uh, summary of the work the previous committee did on the CNA report and the recommendations, um, and we will meet in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thanks, C Councillor McGee. Councillor Hansen. Thanks. The Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee will meet tomorrow at 5 p.m. Um, DPW 645 Pine Street, and, or um, as well as Zoom. It's a hybrid meeting, and it's a big agenda. We're looking at the sidewalk um, work plan and prioritization, uh, Queen City Park Road and Austin Drive scoping, um, North Winooski Avenue implementation update marketplace garage assessment as well as champlain park way update looking at the repayment provision um so number of things hope folks are able to make it up thanks bye or not bye but thank you <laughs> thanks councillor hansen councillor bergman to be followed by councillor hightower um, the charter change committee is going to meet on wednesday it is a zoom only meeting uh, and uh, we are going to be taking up uh, primarily the non-legal resident uh, or the, the legal resident voting um, matter. Um, and uh, uh, we've had some very good conversations about that, including uh, the public engagement process. I had a conversation with Councilor Jang and am looking forward to us uh, taking this on the road, so to speak, uh, and really getting out, out into the community. So, thank you. Great, thanks Councilor Bergman. Councilor Hightower to be followed by Councilor Travers. Yeah, I still don't have a retroactive update because we haven't met, but we are meeting tomorrow. The CDNR committee is, um, and I know folks have been waiting for us to talk about the um, camping on public lands resolution, or I don't think that's the correct term, but folks hopefully know what I mean with that. And we won't be discussing that until our meeting on June 14th, because with the city attorney's office changes, we are waiting for a legal review. Thanks. Great, thanks Councilor Hightower. Councilor Travers. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, there's a written update on board docs reflecting that the Ordinance Committee will be next meeting on Tuesday, uh, May 31st, uh, to discuss short-term rentals. Um, uh, the only thing that I will add is um, that I, I appreciated the discussion that we had tonight on that resolution. I think that it's, it, it was helpful to further gauge the sense of the Council on this issue um, and uh, appreciate comments raised by some, in, in, including Councillor Hansen, with respect to uh, questions on for those items that, uh, for those short-term rentals that are left out of whatever enforcement framework we come up with. Um, what's the timeline on, on when and how they'll be enforced, and to what extent is the council going to uh, uh, honor those bookings? So appreciate those comments and, and look forward to the discussion in committee. Thanks, Councillor Travers. Any other councillors with committee reports? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, City Council General City Affairs. Any councilor like to comment on General City Affairs? Councilor Hightower. Um, yes, this is, um, sorry, I know these are usually not so long, but um, I just wanted to address, um, as the Ward 1 Councilor, the Trinity Campus Project. Um, I think the council, or at least members of the council, tried to make fairly clear what was important to us on um, the Trinity Campus. Um, zoning uh, request changes and this is going to the Planning Commission on Wednesday and we've not heard back on any of the requests that we made which I think means that they are being um, largely ignored and I think that it is very important to the residents of Ward 1 and I think other members of the city that um, UVM commit to not housing more students off campus um, and that is not an agreement that we've made yet, so I will continue to raise this issue um, both today and at the Planning Commission and throughout the steps in the process, and I hope that we, we get a new update on that. Great, thank you. Uh, any other counselors on General City Affairs? 
Well, then we will move on to the next item, which is um, City Council President updates. I just have two. The first is, as we all know, May 20th, last Friday, was the deadline for anyone who wish, wishing to serve on a commission or board for the annual appointments that we go through next month. Um, the next step was the selection of four counselors to serve on a boards and commissions committee, and that was done, uh, that was developed um, as per a resolution that the council passed back in 2015. So we have four counselors that have stepped forward, brave souls that they are, um, to uh, serve on this committee, and that is counselors Bergman, Carpenter, Jang, and McGee, um, who will also be serving with um, Chief of Staff Riddell, who will join them as a representative, representing the administration. Thank you all very, very much for agreeing to serve on this committee. Um, and I believe we are, they are working towards a, a date um, for the first meeting. Um, uh, I will not be serving on that committee, so it will be up to the four members and the Chief of Staff to have a chair who will guide the process and then let us know how things are going. Um, and then also wanted to mention that there were uh, three other counselors who stepped forward um, willing to um, offering to review our council rules and that would be counselors Barlow, Shannon, and Hightower. Um, and that was something that we had discussed at our council retreat. So. It's been a while since we've reviewed our council rules and given some of the changes that I think we would all like to see made to our council meetings. Um, this will be a good opportunity to, um, to take a look at those rules. And I, um, I will join this committee, or this actually just a group that we will just be meeting, um, and be, we'll, we'll be in touch with the other four of you to set up a time to meet. Um, with that, our last item of the evening is comments from the mayor. Uh, mayor Weinberger, you have the floor. Thank you, President Paul. The improvement of the weather the last couple of weeks, uh, it's been exciting to see the downtown um, really coming back alive and, and return to some of the pre-pandemic feel that we haven't experienced in a long time. And um, there, I just wanted to share my remarks tonight. There's some events coming up that should continue that. Uh, before we meet again, um, the uh, Jazz Fest, Discover Jazz Fest will return to downtown Burlington June 3rd through the 12th are the Jazz Fest dates this year. The Flynn and Discover Jazz have really added a, a new twist this year with a couple of guest curators, um, really changing, I think, a lot of the some of the spirit and um, focus of the events, and I really encourage everyone to check out the events. Uh, almost all the events, again, this year are, are free events, uh, similar to last year. There are, are several ticket events, but for the most part, there, there's a, a, a real commitment to this being an event open and accessible to all. The um, first of the new BTV Markets events will take place on June 4th, also before our next meeting. Um, there is a web page up now where you can really start to get a feel for this exciting new market. 49 different vendors that are um, uh, listed um, on, the, on the website. It's a, a, a quote, eclectic collection of local artists, makers, live music games, and kids' activities um, taking place in and around City Hall Park. And Hope um, everyone will come out and uh, participate in this first of these events. It will be then every Saturday through October. And then finally, um, also taking place on, on Saturday, June 4th, there will be a, um, a ceremony for the placement of a historic marker in um, the Lakeview Cemetery. This will be a marker to uh, recognize um, the graves of 30 uh, uh, soldiers from uh, the War of 1812 who have been re, uh, relocated to that um, uh, cemetery and, and uh, in conjunction with uh, the UVM Historic um, uh, Preservation Department, um, there'll be uh, a ceremony for the uh, placement of that, that new historic marker. That's what I got for tonight, President Paul. Hope to see you all around uh, at these events and before we, before we gather again uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. With no further business, uh, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved.
Uh, motion made by Councillor McGee and seconded by Councillor Jang. Um, all those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, we are adjourned at a few minutes before 10 p.m. Our next meeting is June 6th. Um, hope you all have a wonderful evening and I would say weekend, but it's only Monday. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thanks for joining us online.